Um, mm. Hello? Ah, she's got no head. Welcome back to the channel, Harkin Homies. Tonight's compilation is Philo Vance. This radio show was based on The Detective, written by the author S.S. Van Dyne. This series ran on NBC in 1945. Most of the episodes that survived are from 1948 to 1950. So join us for Philo Vance. And as always, thanks for tuning in. The makers of Raleigh Cigarette present John Emery, star of the Broadway success Angel Street, as Philo Vance in S.S. Van Dyne's murder mystery, The Case of the Cellini Cup. Good evening. I am Philo Vance, occupation criminologist. And tonight I'd like to tell you the adventure of the Cellini Cup. As I pieced this fantastic and incredible story together later, it started something like this. In the East 70s of New York City, deep in the gloomy shadow of the 3rd Avenue L, is a dingy little second-hand store called the Old World Curio Shop. It's about 10.30 at night. The front of the store is filled with the usual miscellaneous rubbish, but in the back there's a rather a good workshop. There's a light on there. The man is hunched over a workbench, repairing the enamel on, of all things, a cloisonne elephant. This man is Paul Getman, about 43. Rather heavy set, oily complexion, little pig eyes, smug and self-satisfied. But a clever worker. An unpleasant man, but then he hasn't long to live. Although he doesn't know that. <laughs> There's a discreet knock on the door at the front of the shop. Oh. He gets up and walks through the store to the door. Oh, it's you. What do you want? Well? Hey, hey, put that gun down. Someone's liable to get hurt. <laughs> Wait a minute. Take it easy. What are you going to do? No. No, you don't dare. You can't get away with it. That's murder. For God's sake, don't do it. Well, why don't you say something? What are you waiting for? I know. I know what you're waiting for. You're waiting for the elevated train. You're waiting for the elevated train to drown out the sharks. Well, I got back on the and I'm going to... Philo Vance will be back in a moment, but first... You know, when a friend of yours gets a new house, you naturally want to go and see it. Well, an old tried-and-true friend of yours, Raleigh Cigarettes, is living in a brand new house, and you really ought to see it. Because Raleigh's new house protects you by protecting Raleigh's. How? This new house is an exclusive new package, which gives up to 400% more protection than the package on other leading brands. This means that Raleigh Cigarettes come to you factory fresh. Never harsh and bitter, always rich in flavor and fresh. Smokers, you'll thank me for this if you follow my suggestion. Make your next pack Raleigh's, America's freshest cigarettes. And now, here is Philo Vance to tell you the story of the Cellini Cup. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. Well, to explain how I got involved in this, John F.X. Markham, the district attorney, is an old friend of mine, and bright and early the morning after Getman was murdered, uh, much too bright and much too early, Markham came over to my apartment and dragged me over to the old world curio shop to view the mortal remains of Paul Getman. Sergeant Heath of the Homicide Squad met us at the door. A businesslike frown on his broad, pugnacious features and gestured toward the body. Well, here he is, shot through the heart. Doc Baker examined the body and pulled a thirty-two slug out of him. I would have bet my shirt it was a forty-five. 
Made a big hole going in. Mm, so it did, Sergeant. No well, signs of a struggle. Who found the body, Sergeant? The patrolman on the beat. The burglar alarm went off and he came running. Looks like Getman set it off himself. There's a button right here on the counter, and we found Getman's thumbprint on it. Look at this, Markham. What's that, Vance? This utterly atrocious tie Getman was wearing. Imagine the embarrassment of being caught dead wearing a purple horror like this. I thought it was kind of snappy. Sergeant, you distress me. I've never seen you out of your uniform, but I'll wager you're a panic. Now, Vance, let's not get into a discussion of what the well-dressed corpse should wear. Calm yourself, Markham. Ah, what have we here? A little circular bit of charred cloth. Must be a clue, eh, Sergeant? I already seen it. I figured whoever came in here to bump Getman off hid the gun under something. Maybe a handkerchief. And when he fired, this piece of cloth was blown off. Figured that out myself. Not bad, huh? Sergeant, you've been going to night school. Suppose you tell us what you found out about the late Mr. Getman. Okay, he was in his early 40s. He owned this shop. He did repair work on fancy art objects for the museum and art dealers. And he was pretty good at it, I guess. He had a little apartment at the Windsor Arms, and that's about all. Hey, looks like a customer at the door. That's his second today. Markham, isn't that George Henry Howard? Yes, it is. The art collector? Yes, but there's more of the collector than the artist in him. Before the war, he traveled over Europe sweeping up statues, porcelains, tapestries, and so on like a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> Between George Henry Howard and William Randolph first, the museums on the continent were left looking a trifle seedy. Let him in, Sergeant. Okay. Well, well. Mr. Vance, isn't it? How are you, Mr. Howard? Fine, fine. Never better, thanks. Mr. Markham, our district attorney and champion of justice. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Markham? And Sergeant Heath. How are you? How do you do? Is uh, Mr. Ketman here? Yes, but he's not speaking to anyone. He was murdered last night, Mr. Howard. Murdered? Really? Oh, definitely. Well, that's too bad. From my standpoint, as well as his, I wanted to buy a group of items in here. Uh, will his death interfere with selling them? Well, that would depend on whether there were any heirs and so on. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Well, there seems to be a few pieces of some value in this case. Let's see, there's the triptych, the cloisonne vase, a copy of the Cellini cup, this beautiful German horizontal clock with hunting scenes in relief, circa 1600, I'd say. And quite right you are, Mr. Vance. Mm. Uh, by the way, Mr. Markham, I'd like to put a deposit of, uh, say, 4,000 on the contents of this case just to ensure my getting it. I'd top any bid by 250. Could I do that? Well, we'll have to take that up after the investigation is concluded. All right, fine, Mr. Markham. Thank you very much. If I can be of any help. Thank you. Quite all right. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mr. Vance. Goodbye, Mr. Goodbye. Goodbye. Four thousand bucks for that stuff? I could do better at the five and dime. Yeah, worth about two thousand. Oh, Sergeant, you mentioned another customer. Oh, yeah, before you got here. A man by the name of Hans Hendricks. An art dealer, he told me. Oh, yes. The Hans Hendricks gallery is on 57th Street. Anyway, he came to pick up an art object Getman was repairing for him. He had a receipt for it, so I let him in to make sure it was here. But I didn't let him take it. Oh, I'll answer it. Maybe my office. Well, um, what do you think of this, Sergeant? Oh, I got a theory. When there ain't no clues, I always say what the French say. Church a femme. Church a femme. Uh, Church a Femme, eh? Yeah, in French, it means look for the dame. Oh, thank you for the translation, Sergeant. That's okay. That was the office, Vance. His wacker tells me they got the license number of a car that was seen here last night. Well, now we've got something concrete to work on. I have nothing very exciting to do this afternoon. Suppose I take this gentleman and scholar, the incredible Sergeant Heath, and the two of us will trace that license number to its lair. <laughs> It's like I tell you, Mr. Vance, you don't have to be no genius to solve murders. All you do is ask the right people the right questions. Providing one can find the right people. Well, we sure got a lot of information so far. The owner of the car rented it to a guy named Tony Carpini who lives in Queens. Yes, and this Carpini had a date last night with a girl named Norma Allen who lives in Flushing. Church a fam, huh? She'll be in Mr. Markham's office tomorrow morning. I'll pick up Carpini and we'll... Well, we'll ask questions and solve the murder. You make it sound delightfully simple. Yeah, it's a cinch. 
I guess I know how to figure these things out instinctively. Sergeant, you've been most instructive. Oh, that's okay. Well, now, let's get on to the Hans Hendricks galleries. I'd like a few words with Mr. Hendricks. Please sit down, Mr. Vance and Sergeant Heath. Thank Thanks. You. Now then... I'm at your service. Well, Mr. Hendricks, I'm looking for one of your messengers in connection with the Getman murder. A guy called Tony Carpini. Ah, so. Unfortunately, he is no longer in my employ. You mean you fired him? Yes, this morning. So you are looking for Tony, eh? I'm glad I got rid of him. If I'm not too inquisitive, Mr. Hendricks, why did you dismiss him? I did not trust the man. And, of course, you had excellent reasons for not trusting him? He had quite a temper. Just lately, he was very surly. Not a man to trust with a gun. A gun? Did he carry a gun? My messengers often deliver valuable pieces. I believe I saw in the papers that the bullet was a thirty-two. Yeah, that's right. You may be interested to know that Tony's gun was a thirty-two. I, I, I have it here in my desk. Well, well, right in your desk. Now, that's convenient, Mr. Hendricks. He turned it in when I discharged him. Yeah. There you are, Sergeant. Thanks. I'll just take this along. Where did Tony keep the gun? After work, I mean. In his locker with his uniform. I presume he had a key to the delivery entrance? And he could get in at night if he wanted to? <laughs> Easily. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Mr. Hendricks. Oh, uh, say, before I go, my wife wants an extra chair for the living room, and I noticed that one by the door as we came in. And the sergeant sat in it, bounced in it, slumped in it, and finally decided he and the chair were soulmates. <laughs> it's that carved chair with a needlepoint upholstery. Of course, of course, I know the chair. How much are you asking for it? It is priced at $575, I believe. Holy cow, I can get the same thing at Ludwig Bauman's for $3,175. Well, thanks again. Not at all. Goodbye, gentlemen. Goodbye. All right. Now we're really getting somewhere. And without none of that fancy uh, psychology of yours either, Mr. Vance. That guy Hendricks was pretty helpful. Wasn't he, though? Almost too helpful. What's the news this morning, Markham? You look like the cat that swallowed the canary and went proudly around hiccuping feathers. Well, Vance, Sergeant Heath's out tracking down our man now. I told him to bring him in as soon as he located him. And who is the man? <laughs> I never thought I'd hear Philo Vance ask that question. You usually know who the man is. So nice of you to say so, old fellow. You know, Vance, a gun scratches its individual signature on bullets that leave the barrel. So we compared the bullet that killed Getman with a bullet fired from the gun that, that messenger, uh, Tony... Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, here it is. Tony Carpini. The bullets match perfectly. Looks like he did it. My dear Markham, it only proves that a bullet fired from his gun brought about Getman's untimely demise. Vance, you're splitting hairs. Splitting hairs is a hobby of mine, Markham, old boy. A hobby that I thought I shared with all members of the legal profession. Yes, Mr. Markham. Uh, send Miss Allen in. Yes, sir. Ah, that would be our femme fatale, the Cleopatra of Flushing. <laughs> From Swacker's voice, I'd say she left him goggle-eyed. Ah. Oh, uh, come in and sit down, Miss Allen. Yes, yeah, thanks. I'm Mr. Markham, and this is Mr. Vance, a sort of special assistant of mine. A pleasure, Miss Allen. Oh, uh, likewise. We'd like to have you tell us what happened the night of the murder. Well, I had a date with Tony, and we drove around a little, and then we parked, and... He started talking about me going out with Mr. Getman. He got sore, and I told him that we would have to consider our acquaintanceship at an end because I had become engaged to Mr. Getman. She have only been engaged eight days. I didn't even get a ring. Mm, and what was Tony's reaction to the news of your engagement? He was wild. He was mad. He, he threatened to kill me and Paul. Uh, that's Mr. Getman. So I asked him to be so kind as to take me home. Yes, uh, what time was it he brought you home? Uh, about quarter to eight. Oh, he did it all right, Mr. Markham. Oh, thank you very much, Miss Allen. And now... Uh, just a moment, Markham. Miss Allen, how long have you been, uh, dating Mr. Gendron? Oh, about four months, I guess. I met him when Tony had to deliver something to his shop to be repaired after hours, and he took me along. Paul fell in love with me at first sight. I'm considered very attractive by men. Oh, obviously. 
And you liked Mr. Getman very much, I presume. Oh, indeed. Indeed, yes. I, I've always wished to travel, and he was going to take me to South America after the duration of the duration. Paul knew lots of important people, too, if you know what I mean. I'm afraid I don't. Well, like Mr. Howard, the art collector. Paul took me to one of Mr. Howard's cocktail parties. Gee, it was swell. Nobody was there who wasn't somebody. Vance, don't you think... Just a patient a moment, Markham. I even talked with Mr. Howard himself in person. Oh, he was swell. And he showed me some of his collection. You know, etchings and things. When I told him Tony worked for Mr. Hendricks, and I knew all about art from what Tony had told me... I what... see, and uh, you and Mr. Howard got along very well together? Oh, sure. I told him all about Tony and I and Paul, and he laughed and laughed. I was a big hit at that party. Gee... I guess I'll never get to travel after what Tony done. Oh, I imagine another man will come along and be blinded by your charms, Miss Allen. Yeah, I suppose so, but maybe he won't be no gentleman like Mr. Getton. Hey, will you stop oh, showing me around? Tony. Oh, Here's Carpini, this? Mr. Markham. He was out on the town last night, but I grabbed him when he came back to his room. Had his bags packed and was all ready to skip town. Tony, what did you do it for? What did you do it for? You spoiled everything. I didn't kill him. You did, too. You said you were going to. Uh, shut up, will you? I hate you. I'll never give you another day. Will you shut up? I tell you, I didn't kill him. I didn't have nothing to do with it. You did, too. You're a murderer. That's what you are, a murderer. Oh, oh he hit me. Hey, cut it out, Carpini. <laughs> uh, let go of me. It's her own fault. She started it. Take him away, Sergeant. Okay, Mr. Markham. I guess he's a man, all right. What'd I tell you, Mr. Vance? Church A. Femme? Church A. Femme? Come on, Carpini. Oh, nuts. Here, use my handkerchief, Miss Allen. Oh, gee, thanks. You're awfully nice to me. Ah, uh, not I, Miss Allen. Some other gentleman. Well, Vance, are you convinced now? Not entirely, Markham. So I think I'll trot along and see if I can comb a little information from George Henry Howard. Are you going now? Yes, Miss Allen. But before I depart, I think you may be interested to know that Mr. Markham is a bachelor and a very eligible gentleman. Hmm? Confidentially, he's fascinated by you. No kidding. <laughs> Why, Mr. Markham. Vance, what's the idea? Bye-bye, Markham. Oh, sit down, sit down, Mr. Vance. Thank you, Mr. Howard. A very pleasant den you have here. <laughs> yes, I like it. I see the cases along the walls are filled with the ripe fruit of your continental travels. Some beautiful things. You like them, eh? Well, when I saw something I wanted, I got it. Of course, these cases represent only a fraction of my entire collection. Now, uh, <clears throat> these two curved swords are nice. Creases, they're called. I picked them up in the Malay States ten years ago. Sharp as razors. And an exquisite pair of old dueling pistols. Uh, I suppose they are dueling pistols, aren't they? Oh, yes, yes. I got them in France. Beautiful inlaid gold work on them. And you'll notice they're identical in weight, shape, trigger pull, everything. Had to be, you know, to make the duel fair. Amazing. And I suppose these little cloth patches are for cleaning the guns. That's right. That's quite right. Well, what have we here in this case? It looks like a copy of that Cellini cup in the Metropolitan Museum. Yes, it's a good copy, too. Yes, it is. You have a whole case of ivory figurines, I see. Mm -hmm. I collected them for a while. Only a few of them have any real value. By the by, Mr. Howard, I came to ask about Hans Hendricks. You've had dealings with him, I suppose. Oh, yes. You see, Getman's murder is pretty well pinned on one of Hendricks' messengers. It was his gun. Please don't repeat this, but it occurred to me that Hendricks also might have access to that gun. Oh, I see, I see. Do you know... Do you happen to know whether Hendricks and Getman got along all right together? Well, as far as I know. Of course, Hans is a shrewd Dutchman, and... <laughs> He's an art dealer, too. Yeah, I gather your opinion of the integrity of art dealers is not too frightfully high. <laughs> you never can tell, Mr. Vance. You never can tell. Mm. Well, thank you, Mr. Howard. You've been most helpful. Well, Tony, nice cell you have here. Don't be funny. Tony, I'd like to ask you a question or so. Yeah? You trying to help me? Yes. What's your angle? Well, Tony, I'm of the opinion that jail is an unhealthy place to be. If you answer a few questions, I may be able to help get you out. Okay. 
What have I got to lose? Did Mr. Hendricks know about your trouble with Miss Allen and Getman? Well, if he did, I didn't tell him. He might have found out from Getman, though. That's right, too. Did Mr. Hendricks ever give you anything to deliver to Mr. Howard? Yeah, a couple of times. And that Mr. Howard is a right guy. And how did you come to that conclusion? Well, you see, I delivered a vase about a week ago, and there was a party going on. Mr. Howard was pretty tight, and he spilled two drinks he was holding all over me. Oh, Mr. Vance... Oh, just a moment, Sergeant. Go ahead, Tony. Well, he took my clothes and gave me one of his silk bathrobes to wear and had my clothes dried while I sat in the room. Then he gave me ten bucks. I thought that was okay. Hmm. Now, Sergeant? I found out if Mr. Markham was in his office like he asked me to. He is all right. Thanks very much, Sergeant. You're a noble custodian of the law. I'll be right. Go right up and see him. Well, thank you, Tony. Don't worry too much. Vance, for heaven's sakes, what did you bring me here to the museum for? Stop fretting, Markham. I wanted to lift you out of the hurly-burly of your mundane world, far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife, and to transport you to the cool halls of this temple of art. Now, what sort of nonsense is that? Once in a while, you've got to get away from jangling telephones, noisy courtrooms, and intellectuals such as the good Sergeant Heath. You've got to get away and enter this world of beauty and quiet and romance. Look at the Etruscan shield in this case, Markham. Yeah, very nice. What stories it could tell. How many heroes buckled it on and strode bravely into battle shouting some barbaric cry. Yet, here it is today, still full of beauty. Ah, here's the Cellini cup. Remember, there was a copy of it in that case in Getman's shop. Benvenuto Cellini. Artist, writer, swordsman, adventurer, the gay lover of the Renaissance. And over here... Now, Vance, you're not going to take me on a conducted tour of the Metropolitan Museum, are you? I've got work to do. All right, Markham. I have a few things to do myself. But if you and Sergeant Heath will arrange under some pretext for Howard and Hendricks to be at the Old World Curio Shop two hours from now, I'll turn over the murder of Paul Getman to you at the conclusion of a short lecture. <laughs> While Philo Vance is preparing to expose the murderer, Paul Getman, may I take just a moment to speak about freshness and its importance in cigarettes? That's why Raleigh's are living in a brand new house. Raleigh's new house we speak about is a scientifically developed, highly protective inner lining that seals the Raleigh package. Protects Raleigh's more expensive, more gold and tobaccos against flavor-stealing dryness. Preserves Raleigh's full, rich, satisfying flavor. This extra safeguard provides up to 400% more protection. Yes, Raleigh's goodness is sealed in because dryness is sealed out. And this extra protection ensures Raleigh's perfection. Next time, get America's fresher cigarette, Raleigh's. And now here's Philo Vance. Well, Howard and Hendricks put in their appearance at the Old World Curio Shop on the dot of eight with Markham and Sergeant Heath. Howard was his usual jovial self, but Hendricks was quiet. And it seemed to me a little suspicious. I had chairs arranged around a table, and seated Howard and Hendricks with their backs to the showcases. Markham tossed the conversational ball right into my lap. Uh, Mr. Vance will explain this meeting to you, gentlemen. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Well, you both have something you want to get out of this shop, and knowing how complicated the legal machinery that Mr. Markham so valiantly protects is... I persuaded him to settle the whole thing tonight and save both of you the inconvenience of waiting for Getman's fares to be settled. Mr. Hendricks, I believe there's something of yours here in the shop that Getman was repairing for you. A large cloisonne elephant. And Mr. Howard, you wanted to buy the contents of one of these showcases, didn't you? That's right, Mr. Vance. Getman and I had already agreed on a price of 4000 Which seems more than fair to me. <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it, how a small piece of lead can complicate the lives of a lot of people? Tony Carpini didn't simplify matters for either of you. Then he's the one who did it, huh? That's right, Mr. Howard. Church FM. I didn't know I had a man like that working for me. Funny, I always thought he was a nice boy. Well, I don't agree with Sergeant Heath's Church FM theory, as he calls it. I think the motive was robbery. There was one item in this case that Tony might have thought represented a fortune in itself. Just a minute. 
It was this item right here. Look, a copy of the Cellini Cup. This is what lured a man to the depths of murder. But it never will again because I'm going to smash it to pieces on this table. Don't do that. Don't, you fool. Stop. That's the real cup. That's the original. Stop it, you idiot. You're smashing one of the greatest treasures in the world. Sergeant Heat, you may arrest Mr. Howard for the murder of Paul Getman. Well, Markham, the Admirable Curry has just informed me that he will serve dinner in three minutes. Vance, you irritating so-and-so. Sit down and tell me how you knew Howard murdered Getman. His confession clears Tony, but there's still a lot of things unanswered. Well, there's no point in my being coy with you, Markham. Where shall I begin? Why did Howard kill Getman? His confession explains that, but suppose I put it in order. A. Howard was a wealthy art collector who wanted something he couldn't buy. The Cellini cup that was in the museum. B. Getman was a clever goldsmith who did repair work for the museum. He had access to the Cellini Cup. See? Howard bribed Getman to make a copy of the cup and substitute it for the original. But D, Getman made two copies, substituted one for the original, which he kept, and sent the other copy to Howard, who E, for exterminate, decided to kill him when he found he had been double-crossed and did. Yes, yes, Vance, I know all that, and it's necessary to talk to me as though I were a child. Yeah, I'm not at all sure about that, Markham. Oh, go on, go on. What about the bullet from Tony Carpini's gun, matching the one that killed Getman? Stop giving me the story in driblets. Well, at that party Miss Allen went to, she mentioned to Howard that Tony had threatened to kill Getman, and Howard realized he had a perfect fall guy, shall we say. He ordered some items sent from Hendricks, and then Tony delivered it. Howard spilled the drinks on him. With a pretext of drying his clothes, Howard got hold of the gun, took it to the basement, fired several shots into something that wouldn't destroy the markings on the bullets, then cleaned the gun and replaced the empty shells. Yes, but how did he shoot Getman with that bullet? Oh, very simple. Howard owned a pair of muzzle-loading dueling pistols, and he loaded one of them with a the bullet from the gun. Remember that charred piece of cloth that was near the body? Yes. That was used to tamp the powder down. And remember Sergeant Heath remarked about the hole the bullet made? That it was large, and he'd guessed the bullet was a forty-five. Well, the thirty-two bullet was a little small for the gun, and it wasn't going straight when it hit Getman. Uh, Howard was an ingenious devil, wasn't he? Come, come, Markham, don't give him all the applause. Save a little for me. All right, you too are an ingenious devil. But what made you suspect Howard? A number of things. First, my suspicions were aroused when he offered twice as much for the contents of that case containing the Cellini cup as they were worth. Then it seemed strange that a man of Howard's position would invite Getman and his lady love to one of his parties. Of course, though, they were partners in crime. Yes, that seemed odd to me, too. It bothered me, and I dropped in to chat with Howard about it. Saw the dueling pistols and the little cloth patches. And also discovered to my surprise that he already had a copy of the Cellini cup. Why should he want another? So you took another look at the barn in Getman's shop, found it was the original, and dragged me over to the museum where you saw a copy in place of the original. <laughs> Excellent. An astounding piece of deduction, Markham. I exchanged the cups with the full cooperation of two dazed directors of the museum and pulled the psychological rabbit out of my hat. But why did you have me bring Hendricks over here to the shop, too? Well, there was a possibility that Getman might have gone to Hendricks with the cup, hoping to sell it to him and get some money in addition to what Howard had already given him. Who knows? Perhaps he did. And Hendricks had access to Tony's gun. But I was sure that a man who was willing to risk his life and reputation for that cup couldn't sit quietly and see it smashed in front of his eyes. Vance, you're an amazing person. I'm also hungry. Come, Markham. I see curry signaling that dinner is served. I hope the chicken tetrazzini is good. Catching a murderer has given me quite an appetite. Raleigh cigarettes are protected in a way that no other cigarette is protected. Raleigh's live in a new house, a revolutionary new package that keeps them factory fresh. Raleigh's special package provides up to 400% greater protection than the package on all other leading brands against loss of freshness, loss of flavor. Why not smoke the cigarette you know is fresh? Raleigh's, America's freshest cigarette. <laughs> Now, 
Next week at this same time, the makers of Raleigh Cigarettes will again present Philo Vance to tell you and your friends another exciting story. A story he calls The Mystery of the Singing Cat. The part of Philo Vance was played by John Emery. Tom Shirley speaking. This is the National Broadcasting Company. When a man is wealthy, a widower without children, it's possible for some dishonest person to try and get his money away from him. When the widower lost his only child in a drowning some nine years ago, the most logical way to get the money, since the body of the drowned child was never recovered, would be to pretend to be the dead girl. Hello, creeps. This is T4Y, opening the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight we celebrate the return of the master of them all, the inimitable Philo Vance. The story, the case of the girl who came back. About ten minutes ago, in Philo Vance's apartment, the eminent detective has just finished luncheon, alone. Now, however, he has a guest, and she's very much at home even with his servant, Curry. Lay out Mr. Vance's water wings, will you, Curry? We're going swimming. We are not, uh, Mr. Vance. Vance, really, it's a terrific day. I saw in Washington, and there isn't any detecting for me to do. Please take me swimming. It's on the island, no doubt. Along with seven million others who've got the same idea. It'd be fun. Uh, Mr. Vance. It would be a nightmare. I loathe floundering about in the water like a canned salmon. What is it, Curry? You are a canned salmon. Uh, this gentleman, Mr. Vance, remember he's been waiting for you to finish lunch? The one in the hall... He was sitting there when I came in. Uh, don't come in, Curry. Uh, yes, sir. Wait a minute, wait a minute. What's his name? Uh, Martin, Mr. Vance. John Martin. Maybe he'll take me swimming. Well, you can dream, can't you? <laughs> Mr. Martin? Mr. Martin, come in, please. Thank you. You're, uh... You're Mr. Pilo Vance? I am. This is Miss Randall, my, uh, swimming instructor. <laughs> uh, I beg your pardon? How do you do, Mr. Martin? You're, you're probably wondering why I'm here, Mr. Vance. I just had to come to you. This thing is so... So unbelievable, so fantastic. Let's hear it, Mr. Martin. I, uh, I beg your pardon? Uh, Miss Randall, I ought to say, is a detective, Mr. Martin. In a uh, manner of speaking. Oh, I see. Thanks for the manner of speaking. <laughs> Don't mention it. Uh, just what is your story, Mr. Martin? Perhaps I can suggest someone who will be glad to help. It's horrible, Mr. Vance. You see, I live out on Long Island. Great Neck, Long Island. I have a home there in the water. I know the section. I'm alone now. My wife died six years ago. I see. You may remember it was in the papers. Our only child was ground on our beach when she was 11. Oh, I'm sorry. It was a great tragedy, Miss Randall. Mrs. Martin never really got over it. Oh, then this wasn't recent. Oh, no. No, Jean was drowned uh, nine years ago, Mr. Vance. 1936. Yes, yes, that's right. My wife died three years later. The child and I were swimming together. I can remember it so plainly. She ventured out too far while I was on shore, and she... She was caught in a riptide. How horrible. I... I heard her scream, but I couldn't reach her. I saw her body carried out to sea, Mr. Vance. I, I saw it myself. It was recovered? Never. No, from that day to this. Her body was never found. Oh, I spent thousands, Mr. Vance, just to give her poor mother that much peace of mind. But her body was never washed in. Well, I am sorry, Mr. Martin. I can understand a tragedy like that. But I don't quite see... Yesterday, Mr. Vance, Jean came home. What? Yes, I didn't quite get that myself. This, this girl, this fraud, Mr. Vance, this cunning little imposter, she came to my home yesterday and tried to tell me she's my own daughter. What in the... But, Mr. Martin, surely, surely you can tell. Why, of course I can tell. She's a scheming little cheat, Mr. Vance. She's no more my Jean than, than this lady is. I hardly see that it's anything to worry about, Mr. Martin. Why not phone the police? I want to, too. I want to do it once. But my law firm bears my name, you see. Unpleasant publicity of that sort, notoriety. No, I owe it to my associates to keep it out of the papers. But obviously, if the girl is an imposter, you can make short work of her. Trip her up on some simple little reference to her past. To her mother. Oh, it seems easy, Mr. Martin. That's just it. This girl knows more about me than I do myself. Terrifying, Mr. Vance. She knows the house, 
the grounds, the countryside. And she swears she's my daughter. I don't mean to be simple, but where does she say she's been all this time? Oh, she has a story for that, too. Says that she was washed up on shore, a complete victim of amnesia. Oh. Yes, the gall of it. Tried to tell me she's been without memory for nine years and came out of it this week in a fall down the stairs. Mm, she sounds clever. Uh, you don't recognize her, of course. I'm sure she's not my daughter, Mr. Vance. Definitely sure. Well, she would change, naturally. She was 11 when she was drowned. 20 now. Yes, she'd change a great deal. Oh, not that much, Vance. Yet you say she seems well acquainted with her alleged home, Mr. Martin. It's amazing. That's why I can't call the police. Her story is just convincing enough they'd... They'd drag it through the papers for weeks. She's working with someone, of course. Someone who's told her the right answer. Right, Van? You know, I'd like to meet a girl who would plan a game like this. I really would. Then you'll... You'll help me, Mr. Vance? You'll expose her? Still sold on that swim lane? No. <laughs> Not while you cavort with a 20-year-old ghost, darling. I'll stick with you. <laughs> And this brings us back to the library, Mr. Vance. Now you've seen the whole estate. Well, I see your uh, camera enthusiast, Miss Martin. Huh? Oh, those enlargements. Yes, I dabble in it. When the war broke out, my doctor told me to do something to quiet my nerves, so I took up the dog's bed. Oh, some of these are excellent. I have a dark room downstairs. I'll open it up if you like. I'd enjoy it. And now if you'll send the young lady in, please. I'll tell you how great I am, Mr. Vance. I'm in a terrible strain. Mr. Vance wants to see you. What about? Uh, come in, Miss... Uh... Miss Martin. Jean Martin. So we've heard. Sit down, Miss. Miss Martin. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. I suppose he hired you. On the contrary, I should have paid to meet you. I admire your courage. You're very funny. You... You contend you've been an amnesia victim for nine years. Is that right? That's right. But surely you know where you've been. I remember falling. I must have hit my head because there's a bump on it. And that's all. That's all? When I came to, I was about a block from here. That was last night. You mean you don't know where you've been for nine years? You heard me. Oh, your language, chum, doesn't quite go with the day tour around here. Okay, so maybe the last nine years weren't so good. How do I know? Well, that lane puts you in the well-known place. Listen, mister, I'm Jean Martin, and you and nobody else can prove any different. So let's get down to terms. Terms? What kind of terms? Oh, he didn't tell you that, huh? Well, listen, my grandfather was stinking rich. He was lousy with it, see? And it all came to me. Only my father was to get it if I died. And now you've come back for the money that's rightfully yours. Is that it? You think I'm going to let him keep it? He won't even listen to me. Imagine being so mean. You keep out of this. Careful, girls. You did miss up on one small detail, you know. Jean Martin had a scar on her right wrist. A rather prominent scar. And you haven't. A scar can heal, can't it? I had the scar. It's gone now. It's been gone for years. Oh, brother, you're really good. Listen, you... Wait a minute. Keep talking, Lane. What? There's someone listening at the door. Say it. Oh, I know what I'd like to say. A nice afternoon like this, and we come all the way out here to... Get to join us? Come in. Hey, you're... Hey, my door, me. Gladly. And who, might I ask, are you? A long-lost brother, no doubt. Well, I... I work here. I'm the chauffeur. That's right, he is. Bill and I used to play together when we were kids. Would you say that slowly, honey? I'm a little sick today. His father worked here for us before. Bill was brought up on the estate. We used to play together all the time. Isn't that right, Bill? I never saw her before in my life. Why, you... But you did live here. You did play with a real Jean Martin. Sure. She was a great little kid. I taught her to swim. You remember a scar on her wrist, of course? Sure I do. Right here. About an inch and a half. She got it cutting a watermelon at a picnic out on the lawn. Heck, I went with her when my dad drove her into town to the doctor. I see. Well, you've been a great help, Bill. You'll be around if I need you again. Yeah. I'll be around. Thank you. Listen, he's lying. I tell you, he remembers me. He must. Sure, honey. We all do. Now, will you ask your papa to come in here, Jean? Listen, you can stop cracking, both of you, because I'm Jean Martin, brother, and that's sick. Ask him to come in, please. Sure. Go ahead. Play detective all your life. Hey, Daddy. You're through, Mr. Vance? Well, it wasn't much effort, Mr. Martin. The local police could have handled the situation nicely. Uh, let's all sit down a moment. Sure, I got all the time in the world. You scheming little... Take it easy, Daddy. On the way out here, young lady, Mr. Martin explained that you're unusually well acquainted with this house. In short, that you can answer questions an outsider wouldn't know. I told you I used to live here. Remember? You knew, for instance, that your mother played the piano. That the Rose Garden was once to the north rather than where it is now. 
that the roof on the east wing is new. Yes, there was a great deal more, Mr. Vance. It's uncanny. Well, obviously the girl's been well coached. Is uh, Bill in on the deal, Jean? What? My chauffeur, Bill? We've met him, Mr. Martin. Why, that's absurd. I practically raised the boy myself. His father died right here in my employ. Try again, Mr. Detective. Uh, suppose... Uh, suppose we try money, Jean. Does that interest you? Sure it does. If the money belongs to me. Don't forget I'm Jean Martin. You know, Mr. Martin, the girl might be telling the truth. Oh, that... Why, that's ridiculous, Mr. Vance. I'm surprised you mentioned such a thing. Stranger things have happened, you know. And the girl is right. Childhood scars do disappear in time. But, but I... I As don't... for her amnesia, that's entirely possible, too. Now you're doing okay. Dan, what in and the... My suggestion, Mr. Martin, is that we settle this some way now. Right here in this room. I... I think I'll have a drink. Well, oh, perhaps that would help us all. Lane? You sound like you've had ten, Dan. Why, any food. Later, pets. Let me alone. There's only scarf here in the library. If you, uh... Well, that will do nicely, thanks. Let me pour the drink. I'm your daughter, you know. You want one, too? I might as well. I feel it already. Here you are, Mr. Vance. Ah, thank you. Now then, let's drink to... to the success of our bargaining. How's that? To the success of what we'll accomplish here. <laughs> Mr. Vance, wait! What, Miss Martin? Vance, no, don't drink that. It's poison, Vance. That glass is full of poison. Vance! Well, I... I seem to have spilled my drink. Sam, you didn't drink it. Uh, thanks, Mr. Martin. No. Well, I'm sorry I had to knock it out of your hand, Mr. Vance. You devil. Why, listen. Smell that, Mr. Vance. Why, I know that odor anywhere. It's the emulsion I used in my dark room downstairs. You little fiend. You knew I kept chemicals in there. Then, when Mr. Vance was going to expose you, you decided to poison him. Good Lord. I, I am grateful to you, Mr. Martin. It seems I almost drank a developer highball. You're off the beam, all of you. Why, I... You keep quiet. I've had enough out of you. Well, Mr. Vance, shall I call the police? It won't be necessary, Mr. Martin. Miss Randall and I are driving into town. We'll take our young friend with us. Why, you chump. Oh, and I'd like to take Bill, too, Mr. Martin. I'm not entirely sure he isn't mixed up in this. Oh, take them all. I just want this woman out of my house. I assure you, Mr. Martin, you've seen the last of her. I mean, uh, with all this? No, I think not, Curry. I'll call if I need you. Ah, uh, yes. Oh, Vance, dear. Yes, Lane? Is it fair if I ask just one little question? Yes, by all means. What in the name of what are we doing here in your apartment? Let's take these two down to the district attorney's office and be done with it. Look, Mr. Vance, you got me all wrong. I never saw this dame before until last night. Oh, yes, you did, Billy. Yes, you did. All right, kids. I think the show's gone far enough. You can take that layer of skin off your wrist, Jean. Vance, what in the world is... This is what I mean, let me have your wrist a moment. Get away from her. All right, Bill. I'm quite convinced she is Jean Martin. Ah, see? Just an ordinary skin patch, isn't it, Jean? And very neatly applied, too. She, she's got the scar. She has. Miss Martin, Miss Randall. How do you do? You win, Mr. Grant. You found her, of course, Bill? Yes, sir. I never gave up looking for Jean. The amnesia story is true, then. Quite true, Mr. Grant. I came to on the beach about six miles from our house. On the day I was supposed to be drowned, I mean. I was 11 years old. The doctors figured a wave, threw her up against a log or something in the water, Mr. Vance. Her head was cut. And then, Jean? Well, I couldn't remember anything, Mr. Vance. For days I'd walked around in a kind of a dream, and then finally I was taken to the Good Shepherd Orphanage. Well, you can phone them and check if you like. I've been working there for my boarding room. Go on. Well, just as Bill said, he always looked for me. He never believed I was John. I couldn't afford to hire detectives or advertise, Mr. Vance, especially working right there in the Martin home. I'd just ask questions and write letters. Then when a reply sounded worthwhile, well, I'd investigate in my time off. And one letter came to the Good Shepherd asking about an amnesia case in 1936. And so they told Bill about me. Bill came up to see me and... Well, here we are. I see. Well, that clears up a great deal. Vance, you're out of your mind. Why, those two are bigger phonies than I thought. Why, Lane? Well, for one thing, why did our hero here keep all this from the girl's father? Why not let him spend his money looking for his own daughter? He thought she was dead. Oh, and you knew better, I suppose. Mr. Martin was careful that there was almost no publicity at the time of the drowning, Miss Randall. Just a little too careful. 
Why did he want to keep it quiet when the body wasn't found? Okay, we'll skip that for a minute. Suppose you are Gene Martin. Why the mystery? Why cover up the one scar that proved it? Why play the tough little mall with us all afternoon? And you, Bill. You pretended you didn't even know her. What goes on here? Fair question, Lane. Going to answer, Jean? Well, you're convinced that I am Jean Martin, Mr. Vance. Beyond a doubt, Jean. Even without the scar. I knew it before we left your home. All right, then I'll tell you. My father tried to murder me. What? Yes, I know that sounds strange, but that's true. I wasn't carried away by the tide that day. And he wasn't on the shore, as he said. He held her head underwater, Mr. Vance. Held her and... And pushed her out to sea. And when I got back, I knew if I proved I was Gene right away, he'd... He'd try to murder me again. And if I went to the police, he'd call me an imposter. He'd even lie about my scar. So the only thing to do was to throw him off his guard by convincing him that I was a fake. You see, we hoped we could find a way to trick him into admitting he tried to kill her. We planned it together, Mr. Vance. And when Mr. Martin called you in, we didn't know what to do. You see, Lane? Just skip me, Vance. I'm so dizzy now. Just let me sit here and spin. Well, it's quite simple, really. Martin called me in to bolster his own case. Now I think we'll unbolster it a little. But how, Mr. Vance? What can we do now? He's got all Gene's money, everything. Gene, I told you once today you've got nerves. Think you can use it again? I can try, Mr. Vance. Good. Now, here's exactly what I want you to do. Martin, sir. Yes, Bill? Uh, that boat's loose again, sir. I'm afraid it's been damaged hitting against the dock. Oh, well, it can't keep that boat tied up properly. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Martin. I I wasn't here this afternoon, you know. Oh, yes, yes, that's true. I'm glad you came out clean in that nasty mess, Bill. Mr. Vance called and told me the police are convinced that you had nothing to do with that, uh, that girl. Yes, sir. Well, we'll just forget the whole incident, son. Uh, boat damaged, you say? Uh, yes, sir. I wish you'd go down and look for yourself, Mr. Martin, and you can tell me what's to be done. All right, I will. Nice night like this, I ought to be outside. Yes, go along, sir, and I'll look at it directly. Yes, sir. I'll be in my quarters if you want them. Thank you, Bill. Oh. Beautiful night. Really beautiful. I ought to get the camera. Moon like that, I might get a good shot without a light at all. Good boy, Bill. Comes a good, solid start. Well, I should have told him to turn on the footlights down here. How does he think I can inspect the boat without light? <sighs> My, what a wonderful night. <laughs> Where the water's deep and cold. And then you took hold of my neck, remember? You held me and you pushed me down, down into the water. Remember how I tried to scream? Remember how I felt struggling in your arms? Do you? You, you didn't die. You, you tried to murder me in this water. You held me down until you thought I was dead. But I didn't drown, Daddy. You see, I'm here now. I'm right here in front of you. You fool. You think you could come back now? 
Did you think I'd let you come back after all I did? That money's mine, and it's going to stay mine. I thought I murdered you once. This time, I'll do it right. Oh, 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 well, you'll see you little idiot. You'll find out. Hey, Martin. Don't move, please. I have a gun. Where'd you come from? From under the pier, in a word. Oh, Bill. Light, please. Light, Mr. Bass. Did it work? Beautifully, Layton. He tried to drown her just as I said he would. You all right, Jean? Get up on the pier, Martin. Watch him, Bill. I'll help Jean. Jean. Oh, Jean, darling. Work. I heard <laughs> you take this revolver, please, and escort Mr. Martin up to my car. You'll find Curry and some officers waiting. Yes, sir. Come on, Martin. This is the end of the line. Well, uh, do you by any chance have a spare towel, Lane? The bottom rung of that ladder down there was just a little wet. <laughs> Sam, tell me something before I bust. Bert. Oh, don't be stuffy. Why were you sure Jean was Jean? Because you saw the fake scar tissue on her wrist? Well, that helped, Lane. But I wasn't sure until Martin tried to make it look as if she'd poisoned my drink. Mm, but... <laughs> Elementary, as that man would say. Martin told me he installed his photographic room after the market crash in 1939. Remember? Yes, of course, but I still don't... But, 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 darling. When he turned on Jean and accused her of stealing chemicals from it for my drink, he said she knew the dark room was there. Somehow, she couldn't help if she were his daughter... He drowned her three years before it was put in, and if she was a phony, she was too well coached to betray herself that way. And finally, Pet, the dark room was locked. Martin said as much himself. You know, Van, in a way, you're rather hot stuff. <laughs> Cold and wet at the moment. Well, oh, give me that towel. <laughs> oh, no. What's so funny? Oh, nothing. I was just thinking, you really got that swim after all. <laughs> Thank you, Philo Vance, for the case of the girl who came back. Now it's getting early again. This is T4Y closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. Good night. Sleep tight. This is the Armed Forces Radio Service. Life Boy presents The Adventures of Philo Vance, starring Jose Ferrer. In the good old summertime, in the good old summertime, she's your tootsie wootsie in the good old summertime. Happy Lane. On a night like this, Vance, no Washington assignment for me, no ridiculous detecting for you. Oh, I love it. In all the realm of crime and crime detection, in all the history of murder, mystery, intrigue, the master of them all, Philo Vance. Tonight, the case of strange music. But first... When it's hot and sticky and muggy, you'd probably like nothing better than to whip off your clothes and hop right into a mountain lake or the surf at the seashore. Well, if you can't do that, try the next best thing. A swelled tub or shower with thoroughly refreshing Life Boy. 
you'll find that Life Boy's grand, rich lather is cooling, exhilarating, and makes you feel fine. You'll feel extra clean, too, because you're Life Boy clean. And Life Boy in your daily bath means you're safe from... B.O. Life Boy is the only soap that's especially made to stop B.O. Life Boy gives double protection, all-over protection and lasting protection. Use Life Boy, and you'll come out of that bath saying, Ah, oh, I feel great. Be popular. Use Life Boy. Tonight, the case of strange music. At the moment, Philo Vance and his friend, Lane Randall, are driving back to town after a dinner in the country, and Vance says, Not a care in the world. What, Vance? Oh, nothing. I just said it's a beautiful night. I've had a good dinner. Curry will have a cold bottle waiting. I haven't a care in the world. Darling, how stuffy. A cold bottle indeed. Where did you pick up that expression? Oh, in the book, if you must know. Certain types of men invariably take their fair ladies back to their apartments for cold bottles and birds. Something like that. Just what types of men, may I ask? Amorous ones. Oh. Well, what's the matter? Don't you think I care, Lane? Really care? About your stomach, the way you sound. Oh, Vance, look! Where? There, it's a carnival. Oh, and a Ferris wheel. Oh, Vance. Well, I haven't been to a carnival in ages. And the merry-go-round. Oh, Vance, let's stop, please. <laughs> Idiot. You'd love it, too. You know you would. Well, come on, then. Only remember, I was all for that cold bird. <laughs> Hina. Oh, don't they smell wonderful? Yes, I know. Boy, large bag, please, for my... Uh, my little girl. <laughs> Lane, dear, the car's back this way. Vance, a wax museum. Here we go again. What wax museum? Right there, see? The bloodiest crimes in history recreated before your very eyes, 25 cents. Oh, golly. Golly. This we've got to see. Oh, mister. I wonder if Van Johnson has this trouble. Two tickets, please. Me and my gentleman friend, we want to see the bloody crime. What your gentleman friend wants, Lane, is something... Oh, don't be unromantic, darling. Come on. Remember that one, Lane? The Snyder Gray murder case? Don't they look real? Oh, here's Dillinger over here. See, he was coming out of a theater in Chicago when they got him. Oh, and look in this case. Vance, it's a... Oh! Lane. That, that man, he... He's real. <laughs> You're a complete idiot. Look, Lane, it's wax, just like all the rest. Oh. Well, it gave me a shock. Funny... For a moment, I could have sworn... You've had too much pink lemonade, lady. Let's go, shall we? Where's the car? Over to the right, I... Oh, excuse me, please. Oh, help me, please. That, that girl, my ankle. I've turned my ankle. She's going to faint. Here, miss, here. Thank you. I... Take it easy. Just lean on me a moment. Lane. Are you all right? Yes, thank you. I didn't mean to faint. I turned my ankle. It's quite all right. Perhaps we can find a bench of some sort. I... Francis? Francis, come here. I can't, Bertram. My ankle. I've turned my ankle. Nonsense. Come along, I say. Then we were getting back. I can't. I tell you, I can't walk. Francis? I'm afraid the lady is right, sir. She did turn her ankle. And I'll take care of her, thank you. Give me your arm, Francis. No. I'm certainly not going to carry you all the way back to the house. Never mind, Bertram. I'll get there alone. You little fool. Must you make a scene every time we go out of the house? Give me your arm. That will do, sir. If you won't carry me, Bertram, I'm sure this gentleman will. What? Do you mind, dear? Francis, I warn you. Would you mind, Mr... Uh, Vance. Philo Vance. Mr. Vance, we live just through the field beyond here. Why? Newberry is my name. Mrs. Bertram Newberry. And this is my husband. How do you do? Francis, I demand that you stop this display and come home. Get away from this man. Yeah. Will you, sir? Uh, Mr. Vance, really, I, I can't make it alone. I'd be delighted. You don't mind, Lane? Oh, no, Vance. If you like, I'll walk in front of you with trumpets. And you, Mr. Newbury? Go on, go on. I warn you, Francis, someday you'll go too far. There we are. Now, we'll just put you down in this sports chair, Mr. Newbury. You're there. so kind, Mr. Vance. Oh, Think nothing of it. Lane. I'm sorry if your husband was disturbed, Mrs. Newbury. If you like, I'll try to explain that you did turn your ankle. Oh, don't bother, please. 
He's gone in the house now. He'll just sulk for a few hours. Let him. I see. Could I offer you a drink? You've been so kind. We should go, then. It must be quite late. It's exactly five minutes to ten. Oh, Ed, dear, I didn't know you were on the porch. I won't be for long, Aunt Frances. I'm waiting for a program on the radio. Oh, excuse me. This is my nephew, Mr. Newberry, Mr. Vance. Newberry, yeah. Oh, my dear, I'm so sorry. I didn't quite get your name. Mud. I beg your pardon? Uh, Miss Randall. Uh, Miss Randall, how nice. Friends, thank you. On the porch, Tom. I saw Bert going to the library. Oh, I beg your pardon. Tom, dear, these very nice people carried me home from that horrible carnival. Carried you? Well, what do you... Uh, Mrs. Newbury has a turned ankle. Oh, I see. He made you go, did he, Fran? It was easier to humor him. He insisted that we walk down there. His little joke. I see. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mr. Randall. Mr. Randall. Mr. Vance, Mr. Ronlander. How do you do? Mr. Ronlander lives on the next estate, our neighbor. Ha-ha. Oh. I didn't see you, Ed. Is that so unusual? Ed, dear, please. I have my car in the drive. Can I drop you people? Oh, thank you, no. We're parked just through the field. Ready, Lane? I am, Vance. You must forgive my husband's behavior, Mr. Vance. He has a rather strange sense of humor. Oh. His money went to his head. Ed, you mustn't. It's true, isn't it? He enjoys his little joke, Mr. Vance, like tonight. It amused him to make me dress up just to go to a country carnival. He insisted that I wear an orchid. It's a very beautiful orchid. My husband and I don't go out socially, you see. Tonight was his way of showing me a good time. He got quite a kick out of it. A friend, no. I didn't mind, Tom. Anything to... Oh, but really, this is most discourteous. I... I shouldn't be talking this way at all. Why not? Is there anybody who doesn't know? Why not put it in the papers, Aunt Fran, and add Bertram Newberry spends a dime. Edward, that will do. Nicely, I think. Well, I'm going to my room. It's 10 o'clock. At least Uncle Bertram won't have to pay for the radio. It's free. Really, I'm so embarrassed. If you'll let me ring for a drink, I... I'll get them, Frank. Uh, no, really, we are going. Take the path down by the river, Mr. Vance. What? It's a little longer, but it's pleasanter walking. Why, I... Good evening, Bert. I suggest you go now, Mr. Vance. Get out. All of you. Get out of my house. Vance. Right. Lane, uh, this is our exit line. Good night, it was nice to meet you. Well. Chummy, aren't they? Oh, come on. He was right about the path by the river. Mm, look at the moon. Of all the neurotic, mixed up, unbelievable. Oh, come now, Lane. Don't be so shocked. You've seen family skeletons before. Never such naked ones. Why, they don't care what they say or who knows it. Money, darling. It makes you that way sometimes. Oh. What's the matter? Blue something? One of my gloves. My good white ones, too. But you want me to go back? Not on your life. Besides, I'm almost sure I dropped it in that wax museum. I remember putting them in my purse in there. Well, we'll stop and inquire. Vance. Yes? Am I crazy, or do I hear music? What? Wait. Listen to me. Why, it's coming from the Newbury house. An organ, isn't it? Oh, Gives me the shivers. Just listen to it. Strange. Strange music. Mournful. <laughs> we will be too in a minute. Uh, still want to see about your glove? Uh, if you don't mind, Vance. They're so darn hard to get these days. Isn't it odd what meeting people like that will do? Gosh, we had so much fun at this carnival an hour ago. Now it seems almost sordid. I'll ask you about the glove. What was it? White kid. Okay, kid. I suppose it is silly to worry about people like that. I suppose... Oh, I don't suppose anything. Have they found it? No. For 50 cents, we can go into the museum and look for ourselves. But didn't you tell him that we were... I didn't argue, Lane. It's easier to buy the tickets and look. Come on. Well, it won't be there now, I'm sure. I don't even want to look at the exhibit. Not now. No, Snyder and Gray haven't changed me. I'm his Dillinger. Look for my glove, silly. We've seen the exhibit. It's amazing how they can take wax and... Lane. Did you find it? Lane, in that exhibit. That body is real. Oh, no, you don't. I bit once, darling, but not Lane, again. I'm serious. Look. Good Lord. Vance. It's... Right, Lane. That's Bertram Newbury's body. <laughs> Uh, 
Bertram Newberry, his body part of an exhibit in a wax museum. We'll return in just a moment with more of the case of strange music. But first... My old friend, the life boy Foghorn. You don't scare me. I'm taking a life boy bath right now. I used to say to myself, what's wrong with me? No dates, no friends. And I couldn't imagine why. Didn't dream I had B.O. Oh, what a fool I was. But I always feel safe now with Life Boy in my daily bath. I just love my bath with Life Boy. Such mild and gentle lather. It really is divine. I just love my bath with Life Boy. So smoothing and refreshing, it makes me feel fine. I'll be fresh and dainty, no matter where I go. Cause my life boy bath really stops be old. You try life boy, it's swell. And now, back to the adventures of Philo Vance. <laughs> You came out fast enough, John. You remember Lane, of course. Lane, the district attorney. Of course I do. How are you, John? Well, not too happy, Lane. I just bid a small slam when Vance's call came in. Well, where are they, Vance? Inside? Well, I suggested they stay in the library. As soon as I found a patrolman to remain with the body down at the carnival, Lane and I came back here to the house. Yeah. Who was here? All of them. Francis, the wife, Ed Newbury, he's a nephew, and Tom Rhinelander. Who is, to put it delicately, interested in Mrs. Newbury. I see. Any ideas, Vance? Oh, I'm full of them, John. Care to hear? I would. Well, down in the wax museum, we have a body. The body stabbed in the back and placed in an exhibit. Fifteen minutes before it was placed in that case, that body told us to get the blazers off this porch. Which we did. Uh, go on. Inside, three people. A wife who was quite obviously put up with a lot from the old boy. And who loves her neighbor. <laughs> Tricky, darling. Thank you. Number two, a disgruntled nephew who apparently had nothing to do in life but wait for the reading of his uncle's will. Money. Bertram's money seems to be Edward's big interest. And finally, the boy next door. Uh, he's got money, incidentally. I know the name. Well, he's rather pleasant, John. We had a little talk while you were on your way. Oh, then you questioned him. And two at the house. Vance has been playing detective like mad, John. Oh, thanks for the playing name. Well, Vance, who, what, why? Well, frankly, John, I'm not sure. Not sure at all. What about the servant? Oh, all accounted for. Uh, let's go in, shall we? Lane and Mrs. Newbury were hitting it off so well earlier this evening... Maybe there's a chance for a beautiful friendship. All right, son, what's your story? I could write a book. Well, you might have to. You admit the knife in your uncle's back belonged to you? Look, I went all through this with him. Sure, it's my knife. I use it fishing. And you left it where, Ed? In my room, I told you. It was in my fishing box. I saw it there this morning. May I cut in? Sure, go right ahead. When you left us on the porch this evening, Ed, you announced that it was 10 o'clock. Remember, Van? Vividly. And we found your uncle's body down at the Wax Museum at 10.20, so it's simple. Account for those 20 minutes and you haven't anything to worry about. Can you account for them, son? I, uh... I was listening to the radio. Alone? In my room. I was alone. <laughs> That's not a very good accounting, boy. Look here, That I'm... will do. Send in Mr. Rhinelander, please. And don't leave this house. I'll warn you again. Yeah. Tough, isn't he? His knife, his money when Newbury dies. That's a familiar story, then. But the fingerprints on the knife were not a man's. The sergeant was sure of that. Easy enough. Ed got Francis to handle the knife, then preserved her prints by using a handkerchief. A very old trick. Then they are her prints, John? He check. They're hers, all right. They match with everything in her room. In my room? Oh, come in, please. Come in. I didn't hear you. Thank you. It's after midnight. I was just wondering, is it entirely out of order if I have some food prepared? Now, see here, Mrs. Newbury. Oh, uh, John. Yes, that. Uh, an excellent idea, food. By all means, see to it, Mrs. Newbury. I'm starved. Why, Vance? And ask Mr. Rhinelander to come in, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Vance. I'll have sandwiches and coffee brought in. Ed said you wanted to... Oh, friend, dear. It's all right, Tom. It's all right. Come in, Mr. Rhinelander. Come right in. Thank you. Now, this is going to be abrupt, I'm afraid, but quite to the point. You are in love with Mrs. Newbury. Very much, Mr. Markham. Are you shocked? Why, no. I'm the cad who loves another man's wife, I suppose. But Bert... Bert wasn't a man. Not to Francis. 
He... Uh, go right on talking, Mr. Rhinelander. I just want to... Oh! Silly way to make sandwiches, Mrs. Newbury. Crouched against the door. Come in. There isn't anything to say. Is there? I was listening. If you ask me, I think there's a lot to say. Do you, Lane? What? You can ask questions all you want to, Vance. You know who did it, and so do I. You're a forgetting motive, you know. Edward had that. Right, Vance? Oh, money's a good one, John. Always was. Motive my foot. This woman hated her husband. Yes, and she loves him. It's obvious. You've told them, Tom. Why not? If that isn't motive, what is? And as for the crime, her own fingerprints are on the knife in her husband's back. Well, there is something to that, Mrs. Newbridge. I told you. My husband brought me the knife this afternoon. I was cutting flowers with it. That's just plain silly. There are dozens of garden shears in the tool house. Vance and I saw them. Why go way up to Edward's room, into his fishing box, and use that particular knife? I don't know, I tell you. Well, the boy could have brought it to her, you know. Oh, Heath, send him in, will you? Might as well have the whole group. Well, you made a nice try, Lane, but you slipped up on one detail. Frances couldn't have gotten the body into that exhibit case, not with her twisted ankle. Ankle? See this book on the table? Mm Mm-hmm. Frances, catch! (gasps) See? A very neat catch, Mrs. Newberry. And you were pretty quick on your twisted foot, too. Lane, you've done it. Vance, she's remarkable. Well, Vance... Uh, Where were you between 10 and 10.20, Francis? Oh, Vance. I was playing the organ. You said yourself, Mr. Vance, you heard me when you were walking back to your car. Did you, Vance? Yes, we we did. And you, Mr. Rhinelander, where were you? I was with Francis. I, I was here in this room listening to her play. I see. Oh, John. Yes, Vance. I'm supposed to come in. By all means, Ed, uh, you're just in time for a concert. You remember what you played earlier this evening, Mrs. Newbury? Yes, I do. It's horrible music. Bertram wrote it years ago, and he made me play it over and over again. Some nights for hours. Uh, Play it now, will you please? No? Why? Please, Mrs. Newbury. I'd be glad to. It has no name. It's... It just sounds like this. Quite sure this is the music you played tonight? I told you. Yes, well, that will do, thank you. Now, if you'll excuse me, I should like to offer a musical selection. Vance, you? Well, it's quite easy on this organ lane. You see, it's equipped for automatic player roles. Uh, here's one I picked up about the house this morning. What have you got? Uh, listen, Mrs. Newbury. There we are. Just snap this little switch and listen for yourself. Why, that's. Vance, it's the same music. Oh, surely. Of course, but I... Turn it off. Please, turn it off. Bertram wrote that music. He made me play it over and over. I hate it. I hate it! And you still say you played that piece? After that, Mrs. Newbury? I did, I swear I did. Bert insisted. I played it over and over to humor him. Better do better than that, Francis. I found the roll in your desk drawer upstairs. No, you're lying. But you... Now we're getting somewhere. Turn to ankle. Uh, Vance, will you, uh, will uh, you... Gladly, John. As the detective would say, I'll unravel the whole thing. Edward? Me? Now, listen here. I told you, motive every time. Uh, go on, Vance. Quickly, Edward. You said you listened to a radio program, something called... Uh, what did you say again? The tenor-voiced killer. Uh, he's on every week. <laughs> Strenuous, to say the least. Who done it, Edward? What? Listen at the phrase. In tonight's program, who done it? Why, the butler. Stebbins, his name was. He... He, he poisoned the guy with a secret formula made out of ink. Uh, good boy. Now, that takes care of you, Edward. Sit down. Just how does it take care of him, Vance? I called the studio, John. The butler did it all right. Edward was listening to that program all 15 minutes of it. All right, so it's not Edward. Let's get back to these two. Right, Lane. You weren't playing that organ, you know, Francis. Matter of fact, you were in your room packing. Mr. Vance? Just as you, Tom, were at your house doing the same thing. Your grips, incidentally, are still in the trunk of your car outside. I looked. I... Uh, Packing? For what? Oh, Reno, I should think. Wasn't that why you turned your ankle, Francis? You and Tom had planned to leave tonight for some time. Bert's little joke of attending the carnival almost ruined your plan. It's not true, I tell you. It's no use, Tom. He'll only find out. We might as well tell him the truth now. At last. You were planning to leave your husband tonight. Yes, I was. I, I did make that roll for the organ myself. I was going to put it on while Bert was listening upstairs and then leave with Tom. You made a roll for an organ, a complicated thing like that. It's not hard, John. If you know the keyboard, you can work out just which holes in the paper will make each note play. It takes patience, but it can be done. I had a great deal of patience. And courage, I'd say. Right, Vance? Go on, Lane. 
It's obvious. Bertram found out about their plan, and they killed him. That's good enough for me. But not for me, John. Frances didn't kill her husband. No, and neither did Rhinelander. You thought she did, though, didn't you, Tom? Otherwise, you wouldn't have lied to save her. You wouldn't have pretended you'd heard her play the organ at the time of Bert's death. Now, see here, Vance. If Edward didn't do it, now you say these two didn't do it. Yes, Vance, in case you've forgotten, the man is dead. Who killed him? My moment, eh, Lane? Well, suppose we all walk down to that wax museum, shall we? And I promise when we get there, I'll tell you who did the job. All right, Vance, it's all your show. Go ahead. Well, thank you, John. Now then, here's the original exhibit, as Lane and I saw it first this evening. Lippy the Knifer, that's that figure in wax against the wall there, was standing just where he is now. His victim, also a wax dummy, was on the floor, just as you see Bertram's body now. I can't look. I'm afraid you must, Mrs. Newbury. Really, Vance, we know all this. Someone simply took the wax victim out of the exhibit and put Bertram's body in its place. Right, Lane. Look at Bertram's body, John. Face down, knife in the back. I see that. Now, look at Lippy here against the wall. A body made of wax, but strong as steel. These dummies are steel, you know, with a wax coat. Oh, Lane. Yes? Uh, pull on Lippy's arm, will you? Uh, pull hard. It's firm, all right. And the dummy's tied to the wall. Uh, tied with your fish line, incidentally, Edward. What? Oh, this was carefully planned, Edward. By Very whom? carefully planned. By whom, then? In a moment, John. Now, we'll take the knife from Bertram's body, like this. Oh! It's all right, dearest. And place the knife in the dummy's hand, so. Notice, John. The handle pushes firmly against the hand with the blade pointing out. I, I see that. Now we roll up the dummy sleeve, pull down this rather intricate trigger spring. What, sir? Uh... Vance, what on earth is that? A spring lane. See? We set the knife against it, draw this fine piece of thread out here, like this. Follow me, John? But... Now, oh, Edward. Yes? Uh, will you help me a moment, please? Sure. I want to lift Bertrand's body into a standing position. That's it. Slowly, please. Yes, sir. Mr. Vance, is this necessary? I mean it. Uh, it's quite necessary, Tom. Observe, John. Bertram is now standing directly in front of the dummy, and the point of the knife is directly at his back, in the exact spot where it entered his body. Uh, go on, then. Now we take the thread attached to the spring, place it in Bertram's hand, give it a slight pull, so... Oh! And Bertram is stabbed in the back. You can put the body down now, Edward. Yes, sir. But, Vance, that spring, the thread, all that... Who did it? Who in the world... Well, Vance? No one, John. Bertram Newbury killed himself. What? What? He had time, Lane. We took the long way back here from the house, remember? And while we did, Bertram came down here alone, got into this exhibit, and committed suicide. The end of a plan he'd worked on a long, long time. But I... I, I... Bertram was ill. Ill in mind and body, I'd say. When he discovered or guessed that Francis was leaving him, he planned it that way. Got her fingerprints on the knife and then used this spring mechanism and the dummy to plunge the knife into his own body. That way, Francis, he hoped you'd die for the crime. Good Lord. And I was to be the accomplice. Exactly, Tom. But reason that the police would be sure Francis couldn't have carried him down here, especially with a turned ankle, you were to be accused of doing that for her. Vance. Well, Lane? What were the customers in this place doing while Bert was playing Poke the Circle with the dummies? And see that curtain? It's used when they're changing the exhibits. Oh. Uh, pull it down if you like, Lane. With that cold bird in a bottle, it might not be bad at all. We'll return in just a moment to tell you about next week's adventure. But first... They say there's a manpower shortage. Huh. Hasn't affected me. Girls still give me the brush off like they always have. That's because you're not careful. Not careful? What do you mean? This sound should tell you. Say, have I got... In hot weather especially, use Life Boy in your daily bath. It stops B.O. Life Boy's protection is double protection. First, all over, head to toe protection. Second, protection that's lasting. Life Boy is the only soap that's especially made to stop B.O. So why take chances when it's so easy and pleasant to make sure that you're safe from offending? There's no better summertime habit than wonderfully refreshing Life Boy. Say, I'm heading for a Life Boy bath right now. La, da, da, dee, da, da, da. I'm singing in the bathtub, singing for joy. Living the life of Life Boy. Can't help singing, cause I know that Life Boy really stops me. Oh, 
Be popular. Use Life Boy. The script for tonight's program was adapted for radio by Bob Shaw from the characterization originally created by S.S. Van Dyne. Philo Vance is played by the brilliant young star of Broadway, Jose Ferrer. Lane Randall is played by Francis Robinson. And this is Don Hancock inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time when you'll hear... You know, Miss Randall, you do have green eyes. Lovely, clear green eyes. Get away from me. I like green eyes, you know. At night sometimes I dream about them, hundreds of them. Lovely, clear eyes, all green. No! Put down that knife! Green and cold and lovely. Lay not. Lay! A mad killer, the amazing atomic bomb, and the strangest motive in the history of crime. You'll want to hear The Case of the Green Eye next week when Life Boy again presents The Adventures of Philo Vance. Every pound of used fats that's turned in means fewer American casualties because used fats go into vital munitions that help shorten the war. Used fats are essential to the manufacture of paints, fabrics, and soap, too. Ladies, everyone knows how tough it is to get meat. But the government has announced we will get 10% more of it this month. This is our chance to save more used kitchen fats. So keep on doing your part. Remember, American men in the Pacific are counting on you. For an easier wash day, get Rinso. You'll whistle while you wash because Rinso gives you a wash that's Rinso White. Rinso Bright. Yes, Rinso White, Rinso Bright. And tune in Rinso Show starring Dunninger, the master mentalist, every Friday night. Thrills, music, and plenty of excitement. See your local paper for time and station. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Is there, Doc? Oh, not too much, Steve. Fracture of the right arm and right ankle. I had more trouble with his wife and two partners. They wanted to ride along to the hospital in this ambulance. That's all I need, passengers. Yeah. What happened to the guy we got in back? Auto accident. He had his wife and two partners in the car and tried to wrap it around an elevated pillar. He's a funny guy. He fought against my giving him a hypodermic. I wonder why. No reason. No good reason, that is. He kept saying... No hypo. Please, doctor, I'll be murdered before I get to the hospital if you give me a hypo. That's nothing, though. Shock hysteria brought on by the accident, that's all. I wonder why a guy would think someone was going to kill him. He didn't know what he was saying. He kept mumbling about no hypo right up to the time we closed the doors in the back. Don't you remember? I remember him saying something, but I didn't pay any attention. Well, here we are. Yep. I'll have this back door open in a jiffy and our friend fixed up before he knows it. <laughs> He thought somebody was trying to murder him. He doubled you, doctor? Emergency ward, Steve, sure. What else could it be? Well, I'll hop in and grab the top part of the stretcher. Now, uh, stay right here and get ready to grab it, Steve. I'm ready. Shove it down. Oh, Steve. Steve. Yeah, Doc, what is it, Doc? We don't mark this case, E.W., for the emergency ward. He's got a knife stuck in his right side. He's D.O.A. What? Yeah. Dead on arrival. <laughs> Sergeant Heath, that's all I can tell you. I I could swear he was alive when we put him into that ambulance. Nobody could have got in when we were en route here, and yet 
That knife was sticking in him when I opened the door. That's what I like. A nice, simple murder. Why did I have to be a homicide detective? Hey, Chief, the district attorney just walked in. That's all I need. Okay, Doc, you can go. Stick around in case I need you. Yes, Sergeant, I'll be here. Hello, Heath. Hi, Mr. Markham. Well, we got another one. I know, I've got the whole story. Only it's not possible that a man with nothing more serious than a couple of fractures is alive when he's put into an ambulance and dead when the ambulance reaches its destination. Don't I know it isn't possible. Sure, we got suspects. We got the guy's wife and his two partners. But how can I tell who if I don't even know how? I think maybe this might be a case for Philo Vance. Oh, now, wait a minute, D.A. We don't need Vance snooping around here. That's what you said in the Bishop murder case and the Green murder and the Canary murder cases. But he was the one who solved them. Oh, he was lucky. Look, D.A., give us 24 hours. Then maybe I won't mind Vance. You won't mind Vance? I'm going to ask him to work on this case. Maybe he won't mind you. Hmm, what time is it, Miss Deering? Uh, one minute to five, Mr. Vance. Thank you, Miss Deering. Are you through the letters I dictated? They're on your desk, Mr. Vance. Will that be all? For the next 30 seconds. And then... And then, Miss Deering, it'll be five o'clock, and a coach and four drives up. I remember to call you Ellen, and you forget to call me Mr. Vance. (laughs) Well, 30 seconds are up. I'm glad, Vance. Now we can be ourselves. Where are you taking me tonight? Well, to dinner, for one thing. I never starve my women. (laughs) No good private investigator would. It might lead to a private investigation. Hello, is anybody home? (laughs) Oh, sounds like your friend the district attorney's in the outer office, man. Markham, we're in here. Hello there, you two. How are you? Hello, Markham. Well, Ellen, I see it's after five o'clock. Because I'm sitting on Vance's desk? I always sit here. Chairs are so uncomfortable, Markham. (laughs) And incidentally, how are you? Incidentally, I'm fine. Actually, not so good. Problems? A problem. Vance, will you help us on a case? Police are puzzled in mysterious murder. Now look, Vance. A man named James Dalton was driving his car this afternoon when he had an accident. In the car were his wife and his two business partners, Ed Edwards and Bill Graves. Mm Mm-hmm. Dalton was the only one injured, and an ambulance was called. That's easy. The butler did it. Go on, please, Markham. My secretary will be applying for unemployment insurance if she interrupts again. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the ambulance doctor says Dalton was alive when he gave him a hypodermic and put him in the ambulance. But he was dead with a knife in his side when the ambulance arrived. I don't suppose it could have been suicide or anybody hiding in the ambulance. You know better than that, or I wouldn't be here, Vance. No, suicide is out because the man's right arm was fractured and the knife was in his right side. Mm. There were no fingerprints. That's all I can tell you because that's all I know. You said this Jim Dalton's two partners were with him. Partners in what? A costume jewelry firm, the Eagle Manufacturing Company. What do you think, Vance? Sounds intriguing, doesn't it? What about your police? How does Sergeant Heath feel about your coming to me? Or doesn't he know? What he means is, can he expect the usual non-cooperation from the sergeant? Miss Deering, haven't you a letter to type or something? The name is Ellen and the answer is no. Uh, filing, perhaps, Miss Deering? Oh, ganging up on me, eh? (laughs) Vance? Yes? If the doctor gave Dalton a hypodermic just before he placed the poor fellow in the ambulance, and then the ambulance doors were closed, how could the man have been murdered? Well, it certainly sounds intriguing, Markham. And you might be interested to know I'm working on this case as of this minute. Oh, he doesn't fool me. He's taking this case because he knows already who killed Dalton. On the contrary, Ellen. I'm taking the case because I haven't even the slightest idea of how it was done. Mr. Edwards and Mr. Philo Vance would like to see you. Yes, sir, right away. You may go in. That door there. Thank you. Mr. Vance? Yes. Mr. Edwards, I suppose. Mm. How do you do? How do you do? And uh, how can I help you, Mr. Vance? Mr. Edwards, you're one of the partners of the Eagle Manufacturing Company. That's right. I'm investigating the murder of your partner, Jim Dalton. Well, what do you want of me? Just some information, that's all. I'm trying to figure out how he was killed. I've told all I know to the police, and all I know is nothing. I told the cops I had no idea who could have killed him, and I don't. The police inquired about partnership insurance. Sure, sure, and we had it. A lot of it. But Jim had life insurance, too, and, uh, 
Mrs. Dalton gets that. And I, uh, I didn't tell this to the police, but the Daltons haven't been getting on for years. Well, it seems I'm getting somewhere. I hope you are. Do you mind telling me just where you're getting? Not at all. I'm getting myself out of your office and over to see Mrs. James Dalton. Why don't you stop bothering me? Why? Haven't I had enough with the police all afternoon? Mrs. Dalton, I'm not here to bother you or anybody. I only want to do what I can to find out how your husband was killed and to see that his murderer doesn't go unpunished. You say the police don't know how the murder was committed. Well, neither do I. Ed and Bill and I saw poor Jim last, but it couldn't be either of them. They, they both loved Jim almost as much as I did. According to them, maybe that wasn't so much. What? Well, Mr. Edwards seemed to think there might have been trouble between you and your husband. He told you that? All right, there was. Now I'll tell you something. They both wanted to get Jim out of the firm. They needed his money to get them started a year ago, but they're doing well now and didn't need him at all. And they hated him. Both of them did. Why didn't you mention this before, Mrs. Dalton? Because I didn't believe that... I didn't know what to believe. All I wanted was to be let alone. You haven't been very helpful, Mrs. Dalton. I believe the murder was the result of coincidence. How it was done, I don't know. But somebody wanted to murder your husband and saw his chance after the accident. But how could he have been murdered inside an ambulance? I don't know. I wish I did. Do you drive a car, Mr. Vance? What? A car. Do you drive one? Why, yes. What about it? Nothing. Or something. Depending on how clever you are. I drive. I'm a very good driver. I'm good at a lot of things. Does what I've just said mean anything to you? Frankly, no. I think you're trying to tell me something, but I don't get it. I know only one thing, Mrs. Dalton. That somewhere along the line, your husband's murderer made a mistake. All murderers do. And my job is to find out what that mistake was. Does Steve always drive this fast, Doctor? Well, ambulances are made for speed, Mr. Van. You're not nervous, are you? Nervous? No. Anxious. Anxious to get some information and then get out of here before we have an accident and need an ambulance. <laughs> well, you grabbed me just as we got this emergency call, Mr. Vance. It was your idea to come along, you know. I know. The least I should get out of this Mercy Messenger, which rides more like a roller coaster, is some information. Well, I don't know a thing, Vance. Nobody seems to know anything on this case. Doctor, you're interning at the hospital, aren't you? Yes. Part of my training before I go out to practice. You don't make much money, do you? That's a pretty stupid question. Of course I don't. And look, Vance, you're wasting your time with me. All right, you don't know how this murder was done. Well, neither do I. Nobody knows except the murderer, and you've got three pretty good suspects, if you ask me. I wasn't aware that I had asked you, but go ahead. Well, there's those two partners, Edwards and Graves. All you have to do is take a look at either one of them, and you'll know he'd think nothing of shoving a knife into somebody. And they're both smart enough to have figured out a trick way, too. Agreed. Then take Mrs. Dalton. I watched her when she came down there to the hospital. She's a manic depressive if I ever saw one. Or has all the symptoms, anyhow. Psychopathic? Definitely. Intervals of exultation and depression. Clever mind. Superiority complex. Changes from one subject to another without reason. And maybe you don't know this, but manics are potential murderers. That's very interesting, Doctor. Thank you very much. But getting back to your not making a lot of money and that question I asked you, which you thought was stupid. Yes? Maybe it isn't so stupid, Doctor. Jim Dalton's death meant a lot of money to several people. One of them might have been willing to spend a little of it on you to make sure Dalton died. Wait a minute. Hello, Bill. Surprised to see your partner after business hours? Yeah, I had. Kind of. Come in. Thanks. I came by to congratulate you, Bill. It was a nice, clean job you did on our ex-partner. I don't know how you did it. Frankly, I don't care. You think I killed him? I know you did. Couldn't very well talk about this at the shop, what with cops and that Vance guy hanging around, but I can now. So, congratulations and thanks. I could say the same thing to you and mean it more, Ed. I know you killed Jim. <laughs> That's all right, kid. I don't blame you for not admitting it to me. We don't like each other and we never did, but... Uh, 
I still say you did a good job. Look, I don't have to stand for you accusing me of murder. No, no, that's true. You don't. Uh, suppose we sit down and you tell me how you did it. You get out of here. And if I don't, what'll you do? Murder me too? Well, you dirty... I'll fix you. Keep your hands off me. Yeah. Get them off! I'll take care of you later. Edwards. Who's there? Anybody mind if I come in? Who are you? Oh, uh... Hello, Mr. Vance. Uh... Bill and I were just talking. You, uh, know my partner, Bill Graves, Philo Vance. How do you do? Hi. You mentioned, Edwards, that you and Graves here were just talking. I'm sorry, but I couldn't help overhearing, even a block away. Having trouble, boys? Nothing we need you to fix. I only dropped in to talk to you a minute, Mr. Graves. You see, gentlemen, I expect to have a solution of the Dalton murder by morning. Is it just barely possible that one of you won't sleep so well tonight? This is District Attorney Markham. The Eagle murder case is proving one of the most baffling crimes in our records. Even Philo Vance, whom I asked to take the case last evening, has been able only to corroborate what we already know. That James Dalton was injured in an auto smash-up that his wife and two business partners were in the car but were unhurt, that an ambulance doctor administered a hypodermic against Dalton's wishes, that he was alive when placed in the ambulance and dead with a knife in his side when it reached the hospital. Vance told me he was going to spend last night reading up on the case, but I haven't any idea what he meant. No, Miss Deering, I haven't seen Mr. Vance this morning yet. He must have overslept. Fine boss. Expects his secretary to open the office for him. What will bosses think of next? Your floor, Miss Deering. Thanks, Johnny. When Mr. Vance arrives, kindly tell him to go home and not to come back without a note from his mother saying why he was late. <laughs> I sure will. <laughs> Vance must be getting forgetful. Wow! What hit this place of cyclone? And fast asleep in my chair. Mr. Vance? Vance? Darling. Uh, oh, oh, hello, Ellen. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Vance. <sighs> I trust you slept well in my chair all night. What happened here? It looks like a literary version of a pillow fight. Who's been throwing books around? I have. That is, I haven't been throwing them around. I've been reading them. All night? Practically. Very interesting books. Psychiatric studies. Psychiatric? Mental cases, Miss Deering. Uh, preparing an autobiography, Vance. Mr. Vance? It's after nine o'clock, remember. And the answer to your question is no. I've been doing some very interesting, if as yet unproductive, research. Take a letter, Miss Deering. I will if you'll let me borrow my chair and desk. Sorry. Here you are. Sit down. Thank you. And now, Mr. Vance? Letter to F.X. Markham, District Attorney. Usual heading, dear so-and-so. Dear District or dear Attorney? Dear Frank, here are the facts I've uncovered in the Dalton murder. Got it. Go ahead. I wish I could. I haven't even a theory. Well, that's just as well, because I can't take theories in shorthand. Let's see. The ambulance doctor could have killed Dalton. Edwards might have, Graves might have, and Mrs. Dalton might have. But how, how, how? You're in a rut, Mr. Vance. I'm in a dilemma, Miss Deering. All four had possible motives. But none of them had any opportunity to stab Dalton inside that ambulance. Not even the ambulance doctor. He wouldn't have had time enough. Apparently, it was impossible for anyone to stab Dalton after he was put in the ambulance, so... Ellen! Miss Deering, please. Ellen, I've got it. What? Dalton wasn't stabbed after he was put in the ambulance. He was stabbed before. Before? Ellen, get this picture. Dalton is on a stretcher. Yes. He's just had a hypodermic. He's just about to pass out. His two partners are on one side of the stretcher, his wife on the other. Just as Dalton is lapsing into a coma, one of them sticks the knife in him. Vance, it could have happened that way. Listen, it could have been done without anyone seeing it, too. Ellen, that's it. Well, maybe, but it only eliminates the ambulance doctor, that's all. That's right. Now, let's see. Let's take the partners. Edwards and Graves have violent tempers. Mm. They were almost at each other's throats when I saw them yesterday. Mrs. Dalton, unless the ambulance doctor and I are very much mistaken, is a manic depressive. A who -ic what if? Manic depressive. Oh. A form of psychopathic instability. She's got some of the symptoms, jumps from one subject to another for no reason, overdeveloped sense of superiority, morbid, depressed. That's what I was reading up on last night. And are manic, uh, whatever they are, murderers? They could be, according to what I've read about them. 
They can be switched away from murder, though, to another thought in a second. Maybe Mrs. Dalton forgot to throw the switch. Maybe. But it might not have been Mrs. Dalton at all. Dalton was stabbed in the right side. We know now he was stabbed just before he was put into the ambulance. Whoever was on the right side of the stretcher did the stabbing. Vance, you're wonderful. I'll never commit a murder while you're alive. Thanks. You may now tear up your notes, Miss Deering, and get Mr. Markham on the telephone. Ask him to please have everybody concerned in the same place on the same corner where the accident happened yesterday. Sure, Mr. Vance. This is just the way it was. The ambulance was parked right there where it is now. Only there was a crowd around. Uh, the doc and the driver had the stretcher in their hands just the way they have now. Thanks, officer. Look, Vance, you know this is a lot of nonsense, don't you? Maybe you're going to wish it was, Mr. Edwards. Maybe you're going to wish you hadn't started any of this, Vance. Somebody's going to wish that. But it won't be me, Mr. Graves. Mrs. Dalton? I'm here, Mr. Vance. Now listen, all three of you. I want you to take the positions alongside the stretcher that you were in yesterday. Now, please. Well, right. 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 Doctor. Right. Doctor. Oh, yes, Mr. Right. Vance, I'm here. You are carrying yeah. the back end of the stretcher, just as you're doing now? Exactly, sir. Okay. Now, Mrs. Dalton. Yes. And you, Graves and Edwards. Yeah. Is that the position you were in yesterday while the stretcher was being carried to the ambulance? Mrs. Dalton on the right side and the men on the left? Yeah, yeah. that's right. You'll remember Mr. Dalton was stabbed in the right side. Did you get that? The right side. Wait. Wait. I wasn't on the right side at all. I was on the other side of the stretcher. I walked alongside the stretcher on the other side, where Edwards and Graves are now. That dame's crazy, Vance. We were on the left side, Bill and I, weren't we, Bill? Don't listen to them. They're trying to make it look like I killed my husband. I was on his left side, I swear it. Doctor, please, you must remember. You must believe me. I swear to you, I was standing on the left side of the stretcher. What about it, Doctor? I... I think she's right, Vance. (laughs) Yes, I'm sure of it. When we were putting Dalton into the ambulance, Steve had the head part of the stretcher, and I had the foot part, and... Yes, I remember Mrs. Dalton on my left. You're sure you were there on the left side, Mrs. Dalton? I'm positive. Edwards and Graves were on the right side. And that proves they murdered my husband. On the contrary, Mrs. Dalton. It proves that you did. She She did, Mr. Vance. So so you figured that out, did you, Mr. Vance? All right, nobody move. Nobody, I said. That gun of yours might go off. I'd be careful if I were you, Mrs. Dalton. I'd be more careful if I were you, Mr. Vance. Or any of you. Turn around. All of you, turn around, I said. That's better. I'm getting away from here, and I'll shoot the first one that turns his head. Remember, I'll shoot the first one that moves. What do we do, Mr. Vance? You can make your own plans, officer. Personally, I'm not moving. Hello, Vance speaking. Vance, this is Markham. Just wanted to tell you that we haven't been able to pick up Mrs. Dalton yet. You will. She can't get very far. Aren't you worried? Don't you think she'll try to kill you? After all, you spoiled her perfect murder. She won't come up here, Markham. Her first job is to keep out of the way of the police. She won't waste time looking for revenge. Good night, Markham. Good night. I'll let you know if anything happens. So I won't waste time looking for revenge, Mr. Vance. I don't consider it a waste of time. I don't know a better way to spend the next few minutes than to use it killing you. Hello, Mrs. Dalton. Pretty gun you have there. You don't fool me any with that unconcerned way of talking. I'm going to kill you, and you know it. You know, of course, that people who are going to commit murder don't generally talk to their victims. They just shoot. I don't care about people, generally. I'm an individual. Smart enough to have committed murder and gotten away with it if it hadn't been for you. And smart enough to have slipped in here, kill you, and still get away. It wouldn't do any good for me to say I don't think so. Not a bit. I didn't think so, but it was worth a try. Your hands are shaking, Mrs. Dalton. They're as steady as a rock and you know it. I have complete control over my nerves. Manic depressive. Exactly what I thought. Overdeveloped sense of superiority. Manic depressive? Certainly. All the symptoms. You're insane, you know. What? Oh, it's true. Manic depressive. Singleness of thought on one subject. Can't get it out of her mind. Acute concentration. You mean if I came here to kill you, I couldn't change my mind? You couldn't even talk about anything else. Fashions, for instance. What about fashions? That dress you're wearing. It's an original. I designed it. You know, at first I wanted it to have pleats down the right side. See? I can talk about something else. I'm not insane. I'm not, I tell you. I hear you, Mrs. Dalton. This dress is my favorite. 
I designed it first with pleats on the side. I'll show you how it would look with them, but you won't like it. I I'd planned them down here. I won't need his gun. And you can see for yourself that it throws the lines of the dress off. There. Admit it. The pleats wouldn't be right, would they? Your gun's on the floor, Mrs. Dalton. Of course it is. I threw it there. Those pleats, then, they wouldn't be right, would they? They... They wouldn't really be right, would they? Mr. Vance, those pleats wouldn't be right, would they? Answer me. In a second, Mrs. Dalton, as soon as I pick up your gun. There. Now about the pleats. I'll tell you what I think about them on the way downtown. You won't answer me. You tricked me. I came up here to kill you and you tricked me. But it doesn't matter. You can take me to the police, but I'll find a way of getting out of jail. I'm clever. Believe me, I can do it. Can you? Well, the sooner we get you into jail, the sooner you can try. Shall we go, Mrs. Dalton? <laughs> It's still a few minutes to nine, Van, so before we get down to business, will you clean up a point or two for me? About the Dalton murder, Ellen? Mm -hmm. Well, if I can before nine o'clock, I will. Well, let's hurry, then. When Mrs. Dalton came up to your apartment to murder you last night, what made her change her mind? The characteristics of a manic depressive, Ellen. They can be led easily from one subject to another. I told her that she was a manic, but I lied a little. I said manics couldn't ever change their minds. Oh, so to prove to herself and you that she wasn't crazy, she did exactly what you wanted her to do. Forgot about murder to talk about something else, not knowing she was proving your point. Not to mention saving my life. Anything else, young lady? Oh, it's nearing nine, I can tell by your voice. One other question, Vance. Let's go back to the murder scene. Now, you told me that whoever stabbed Dalton had to be on his right side, yet Mrs. Dalton was on the left side of the stretcher. That's correct, Ellen. Now, look. This desk is a stretcher. Yes. I'm lying on it. Uh-huh. Now, where's my right side? On the right side of the desk. That proves that Mrs. Dalton didn't do it. On the contrary. You see, poor Jim Dalton wasn't lying on the stretcher the way I'm lying on the desk. His head was at the top of the stretcher, where my feet are. I'll show you what I mean. I'll reverse my position. There. Oh. Golly. When, when he was on the stretcher lying like you are now, his right side was on the left side of the stretcher. Certainly. Mrs. Dalton saw what I was getting at, knew I had her cornered, pulled a gun, and got away, temporarily. Darling, you're wonderful. I don't think so, but then, what's my opinion against so many other people's? <laughs> Take a letter, Ellen, darling. Uh-uh. You mean Miss Deering. It's after nine o'clock. So it is. Take a letter, Miss Deering. Yes, Mr. Vance. Dear Ellen, mm. this winds up the Eagle murder case. <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, I have tried to show in my brief lecture just how factual are the case histories on applied psychology contained in my newest book. Are there any questions? Mr. Mary? Oh, yes? Mr. Mary, if, as you say, the subconscious is the stronger of our two minds, why doesn't it dominate us most of the time? A very good question. 
In my opinion, the subconscious is held in check by a controlling band, a band that keeps it under the conscious mind. Were it possible to remove that controlling influence, I am of the opinion that the subconscious would dominate our motivations. Well, if there are no other questions, ladies and gentlemen, I have been informed I have a phone call in my office. Should any of you care to speak to me there, I assure you I shall be delighted. Thank you very much. Hello? This is Mr. Merry speaking. Uh, Mr. Merry, this is George Haworth. I represent the Justine Literary Club. Uh, would it be possible for you to speak to our members next Thursday? Next Thursday? Yes. Well, I intended to return to the coast. Oh? But I think I might be able to postpone my departure. Oh, just a minute. Just a minute. Uh, will you write me a letter, Mr. Harworth, uh, merely confirming our appointment? Oh, I'll be very glad to. Thank you, Mr. Merry. Not at all. Goodbye. Coming. Oh, it's you. I thought I saw you in my audience. I hardly expected the pleasure of a personal visit. Uh, come in. I hope you've come to tell me that you've forgotten the past. How would the French say it? Un de ces choses? One of those things? I'm glad you came to see me. I've been wanting to exp... Oh, why are you staring at me like that? Why don't you say something? What do you want? Oh, no. No! No! No? I think... Yes! Vance? Uh, Mr. Vance, I'm not disturbing you, am I? I could contribute to your ego, Miss Deering, by saying that you're quite disturbing to me. Mm. But I won't. At least, not during business hours. Uh, I'm not disturbing during business hours, or you won't say it during business hours? A combination of both, Miss Deering. You know, I believe I've reached the epitome of success as a private investigator. I'm so private that I haven't had an interesting or unusual client in a week. <laughs> doesn't seem to bother you much. It doesn't bother me at all. You know, I rather like the ambition that gets me down to my office and the circumstances that do not force me to work when I get here. It guarantees my character and places no strain whatsoever on my mentality. Would it be too much for me to ask you to guarantee your character in your own office? After all, it's only through that door, and I have some typing to do. Do I distract you, Miss Deering? Well, I could contribute to your ego, Mr. Vance, by saying that you're quite distracting. So I will. You're quite distracting. <laughs> now let me get to work. Miss Deering. Yes? Take a letter, please. A letter? Okay, I take uh, L for, um... L for... Let me finish what I'm doing. Now, let me see. Uh-uh. Take a look at the glass panel in the door. Hmm? You will not be at ease much longer, oh, serene sir. I seem to see a female profile. And I seem to hear a female knock. Hmm. Come in. Mr. Vance here. I'm Philo Vance. May I help you? Oh, yes, yes, if you only will, Mr. Vance, I... Oh, is there some place we can talk alone? Oh, don't mind me. I only work here. Come into my office if you like. It's just through this door here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Not at all. Won't you have a seat? Yes, thank you. Mr. Vance, I'm Alice Barkley. And I've come to you because you're the only one who can help me, if, if anyone can. I assure you I'll try. Just give me an idea as to what you'd like me to do. I don't know. I don't know what anyone can do, Mr. Vance. I've just shot and killed a man. <laughs> I'm afraid you've come to the wrong office, Miss Barkley. You want the police, or perhaps that's vice versa. Oh, but you don't understand. I, I can't remember anything that happened to me, except that two hours ago I was standing over a man who'd been shot in the heart, and I had a gun in my hand, and the gun was still warm from being fired. You can't remember anything before that? Well, I, I went to a lecture on applied psychology this afternoon with friends. The lecturer was Joseph Mary. You've heard of him, of course. He's written books. Oh, yes. All I remember was that after the lecture, I was standing over his body, and, and he was dead. Mm. What did you do with the gun? Well, I, 
I have it here. I put it in my purse and ran. It it was only then that I realized I didn't know where I was running to. And so I walked and walked, and, and then I came here. But I, I can't remember anything else. Well, I'll do what I can to help you, Miss Barkley. Oh, but I'm pretty convinced that you'll be facing a murder charge unless you suddenly start remembering something. <gasps> Well, Mrs. Anderson, how do you think your husband looks in his new tuxedo? Pretty nifty, eh? Please. Please, darling, I, I'd, I'd like to lie down for a while. Well, what's the trouble, Joan? Come home rather late from the lecture and you're all upset. Here, uh... Here, wait, sit down for a minute. Oh, thank you. That's it. I'll get you a glass of water. Here, let, let me have your hat and your handbag. I'm so sorry. I, I guess I don't know what's come over me. Joan, your handbag's terribly heavy. What's in it? Well, you might as well look... Joan, it's my gun. Yes. What were you doing with my gun? Uh, and one of the bullets has been fired. Joan. Please. Please, darling. I, I don't know. I don't remember. You don't remember? All I know is that I had to take it to the lecture. I don't... Don't ask me why. And I shot a man with it. You what? I shot Joseph Mary. <laughs> District Attorney will see you now, Sergeant Heath. Go right in. Uh, thanks, Mary. Oh, how's his humor today? Very good, I'd say. And uh, don't change it, will you? <laughs> I'll try not to. Hi, Mr. Markham. Hello, Heath. What do I owe the honor of the homicide department's call? This, D.A., you've always been griping about the cases I hand you. There's always something missing, you always say, right? Go ahead. Yeah, this time I got one for you on a silver platter. man named Joe Mary was killed in his office this afternoon. This afternoon, mind you. He was shot. There was a gun lying next to his body. We traced the gun, found its owner, and I'm holding her. Name is Francis Adams. How's that? Sounds like good work, Heath. Just a moment. Yes? Mr. Philo Vance is here, Mr. Markham. Vance? Well, show him in, by all means. Oh, so your friend is here, eh, D.A.? Well, I'm glad. He'll find out that the police don't need him on every case. Hello, Markham, and Sergeant Heath. How are you, Vance? Vance? How have you been, Heath? Or haven't you made up your mind yet? I feel fine, Mr. Vance. Wonderful, in fact, and you? You'll have to forgive the sergeant today, Vance. He feels rather good. He's wrapped up a murder case by himself. Really? What one is that? The Joe Mary murder. Girl named Frances Adams shot him. Is that so? Well, I came up here to tell Markham that a girl named Alice Barkley came to my office a little while ago, and she was under the impression that she killed Joe Mary. Huh? Had the gun she did it with, too. Here it is. Well, Sergeant Heath, this rather complicates things, doesn't it? Any time your friend Vance arrives, there's complications, D.A. My advice is... We'll have to wait for your advice, Sergeant. Hello? Yes? Yes. Yes, of course. Would you bring her right down, please? Thank you. I'll be here. Goodbye. Now, I was saying that my advice... We're going advice... to still have to wait for that, Sergeant. You see, you've arrested a girl for killing Joe Mary. Vance here has a young lady who says she killed him. And that phone call was from a man named Anderson. He says his wife shot and killed Mary, and he's bringing her down here right away. How long does it take that medical examiner to check a body, Sergeant Heath? has been working on Joe Mary's body for an hour. Our friend the sergeant doesn't seem to be in a hurry, Markham. Sure, I'm in a hurry, Vance. Why shouldn't I be in a hurry? When the doc tells us what bullet killed Mary, I'll know which of the three guns I have fired that bullet. I'll know whose gun it is, and I'll know which one of the three girls killed him. Hmm. I guess Sergeant Heath has something there, Vance. Maybe. But I don't think it'll be quite as simple as that. Well, here comes the doctor. We'll know in a second. Hey, Doc. What kind of a bullet was it that knocked off Mary? How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, gentlemen? How do you do, gentlemen? Doc, we're in a hurry. What kind of a bullet did you find in Mary? Oh, patience, Sergeant. Patience is a virtue. All right, so I'm not virtuous. What did you find? We want to know which one of three different gals to hold for this murder. I'm afraid I won't be able to tell you that, Sergeant. Yeah, there were three bullets. Three bullets? Uh, yes, three bullets in Mr. Mary's heart. Three bullets from three different guns, I'd say. Huh? I beg your pardon? The sergeant said, huh. 
That means he's bewildered. Yes, and he isn't the only one who is. Bewildered? Oh, I'm supposed to be bewildered, huh? Well, I'm not. All right, so there were three different bullets fired into our friend, Mr. Mary. Doc, which one was fired first? Whoever fired that shot is the murderer. That's probably correct, Sergeant. Only the three bullets were fired within a very short time of each other. I'm afraid there's no way I or anyone else could tell which one was fired first. Oh, no, it can't be. I'm inclined to think it can. I had a feeling this wouldn't be so simple. Sergeant... May I make a suggestion? Somebody better suggest something. We have three suspects and three guns. I think the first thing we ought to do is find out if those three guns fired the bullets that the doctor found in Joe Murray's body. Which way to the ballistics department, Sergeant? Well, you have quite a good eye, Sergeant. You hit the bale of cotton without any trouble. I got trouble, all right, but it's not because of the way I shoot. Okay, Daniels, get that bullet out and check it with the third one we took out of Joe Mary's body. Right. Now, Vance, what do you think we'll find? The same thing we found in the case of the other two guns we checked. That each fired one bullet into Mary. You know something? I wouldn't mind that. Look... This Barclay gal who came to see you, we know her gun fired one of the bullets, right, D.A.? Yes, that's correct. All right. The Anderson gal whose husband phoned us, we know her gun fired one of them. The Adams woman that I picked up, this is her gun we just tested now. Why, this case is a snap. All three of them were in on it. They're all murderers. I doubt that, Heath. In fact, even if it were right, you could never put all three of them on trial. No, why not? Vance is right, Heath. Only one of those women is a murderer. The first one that fired the first bullet into Mary. She killed him. Supposing the other two did fire their guns into his body. If he were already dead, what crime did they commit? See what I meant, Heath? Uh, We don't know and can never find out which was the first bullet that killed him. Of course, we've got to hold all three of those women. We've got to. Vance, do me a favor. Say that you're a little confused by all of this, too. All right, Heath, if it'll give you any satisfaction. I'm confused. Okay, you solved the Canary murder case and the Green murder case and only last week the Eagle murder case. The DA keeps reminding me that I didn't, but you did. Well, I'd like to see you solve this one. I'd be glad to wind up this case for you, Sergeant. Very glad. And I'd gladly close it for you if... Winston knew where to start. This is District Attorney Markham. The Mary Murder case has everyone concerned, including Philo Vance, completely baffled. Joe Mary was murdered. Three bullets were found in his heart, bullets belonging to guns owned by Alice Barclay... Joan Anderson, and Francis Adams. All admit they brought those guns to Mary's lecture, but can't tell why. At Vance's request, all three women were brought into a detention room at headquarters, and I understand Vance is on his way Well, somebody say something. It's no good for the three of us to just sit here and stare at each other. What is there to say, Alice? We don't know where to begin. Francis, the police are going to find out that you were once married to Joe Mary. Why don't you tell them? And make myself their number one suspect. You can't mean that, Joan. And while we're on the subject, you and Alice ran around with him at college, didn't you? Why don't you tell the police that? Don't try to make it look like we killed him, Francis. Don't you do it. I warn you, I may know more about this than I'm saying. That sounds like a threat. Well, does it? How does this sound? I think you killed Joe Mary. You even <laughs> intimate that again and you'll be the <laughs> sorriest girl alive. Joan! Joan, are we going to stand here and now take Now, look, her? Alice. Yeah. She killed Joan. She killed him. And she's afraid we know how she did it. Now, look, darling. She shot him. I know she did it. Don't cry. Keep that screaming (laughs) idiot quiet, Joan. Keep her quiet. Ladies, please. What do you want here, Mr. Vance? Well, first I want to tell you that I couldn't help overhearing what the three of you just said. Very interesting. But ladies, I have good news for you. You're all free to go home. Oh, how wonderful. Only, of course, you're not to leave town. Not to leave. And Mrs. Anderson. Yes? I'd like to see you in my office the first thing in the morning. (laughs) 
I'd prefer it, Joan, if you'd get out of here and let me finish packing. You can't leave me now, darling. You just can't. Oh, no? Just you wait and see. I'm not going to be known as the husband of the girl who murdered Joe Mary, believe me. Ex-husband, maybe, but not husband. Get out of the way, please. Oh, answer that, will you? I'm having trouble enough trying to close this bag. All right. Hello? Mrs. Anderson? Yes? This is Philo Vance. Oh, why weren't you down at my office this morning as I asked you to be? I'm sorry, I can't talk to you now. You've got to. I just found out that the police know you ran around with Joe Murray at college and that he walked out on you. Please, Mr. Vance, uh, let me alone. I can't explain anything to you. Goodbye, Mr. Vance. I'm going to hang up. And if you or the police think that I killed Joe Murray, well, well, it doesn't matter very much now, anyhow. <laughs> Yes, yes, come in. Come in. Don't keep knocking like an infernal idiot. Good afternoon, Professor Colby. Remember me? Huh? Oh, certainly I remember you. One of my worst students. Got one of my highest marks. Never forgiven you for it. What's your name? Vance, Professor. Philo Vance. Yes, yes, Vance, Vance. Well, Vance, what is it? Professor Colby, can a person be hypnotized into committing murder? If you'd paid any attention in your classes, you'd know that nobody can be hypnotized into doing anything that's against his moral code. Goodbye, Mr... Uh, what you say your name was? Vance. Yes, yes. Tell me this, Professor. Post-hypnosis is a suggestion given to a hypnotized person which must be carried out after he is awakened from hypnosis. Correct? Yes, yes, of course, that's correct. The person receiving a post-hypnotic suggestion would have no idea why he was doing something, but he'd know he'd have to do it. Right? Any child knows that. Children don't take courses in applied psychology. May I use your phone? Well, there's a pay station outside. Oh, this will do very nicely, thank you. I've got to talk to the district attorney and ask him to have three suspects in a murder case brought to my office this evening. And then, Professor Colby, I have a favor to ask of you. A favor I don't think you can well refuse. <laughs> Miss Barclay, Mrs. Yes. Anderson, and Miss Adams. Yes. yes. Let me start by saying I'm glad you were willing to come to my office. Oh, not at all. I appreciate that. Well, Vance, I got them here. Where is this great experiment you promised? Please, Markham. Ladies, I'm going to attempt an experiment in mass hypnosis. Does any of the three of you object to being hypnotized? Well, I, I don't, don't object. No, no, I, I don't, don't either. Think so. You know as well as I that if you fight against it, you couldn't possibly be hypnotized. So thanks again for your cooperation. Now I'd like to present one of our eminent authorities on hypnotism, Professor Colby. How do you do, Professor, Professor? Colby? Uh, well, turn out all the lights except this one on the desk, please, Vance. Uh, you do it, William Markham. You're nearer to it. Well, somebody do it. I haven't got all night, you know. Very well. Uh, yeah. Good. Now, ladies, I want you all to sit back in your chairs. Yeah. Please make yourselves comfortable and think of nothing at all. And if you feel yourselves getting drowsy, close your eyes and sleep. And Vance, there they are, the three of them hypnotized. The conscious mind dormant. You won't need me any longer. No, I know what to do from here on in. Thank you, Professor. I'll be sure you do it. Fine thing bothering me at this time of the night. Good night, Mr. Vance. Mr. Markham. Good night. Good night. Good night, Professor. Hmm. He certainly is a strange sort of gentleman, isn't he, Vance? Professor Colby is wonderful. You know, it's his theory and mine that under hypnosis, if hypnotism was used once before, the subconscious mind will recall what was done at that time. I have one of my secretary's hat pins in my hand, Markham. Observe closely. I'm going to touch Miss Adams' hand with it. There. <laughs> What's up, Vance? Don't be alarmed, Markham. I assure you she didn't feel it. And now for the experiment. Remember, Markham, they're completely under hypnosis. They couldn't lie if they wanted to. Remember that. Miss Adams, I want you to take this gun and shoot it like you shot Joe Mary. She's doing nothing, Vance, just holding it. I know. I'll take back that gun, Miss Adams. Thank you. Now, Mrs. Anderson, please take this gun. Thank you. Now what, Vance? Hand me that hat pin, Markham, please. Here you are. Thanks. 
I'll just touch Mrs. Anderson's hand with the point. There. That's fine. No reaction, Markham. Now, Mrs. Anderson, I want you to fire that gun the way you fired it at Joe Murray. Now. Fine experiment, Vance. She hasn't moved a muscle either. One more subject, Markham. Give me back the gun, Mrs. Anderson. Thank you. Now, Miss Barkley. First, the hat pin test. Ah. No reaction, Markham. Now, take this gun, Miss Barkley, and fire it just as you did at Joe Murray. Now. Vance, this is ridiculous. She's doing absolutely nothing. I know. But believe me, that isn't all I know. I know who killed Joe Murray. Can't you tell, Markham? Miss Barkley. Yes? You've got to help me. I know you were hypnotized the day Joe Murray was murdered. I know who hypnotized you. The real murderer gave herself away in my office a little while ago. But I can't prove anything without your help. In the interest of society and to help trap a clever murderer, Miss Barkley, will you please? Will I be in danger, Mr. Markham? Mr. Vance and I will try to see that the danger is as slight as possible. Very well, gentlemen. I'll do it. Hello, Francis. Oh, it's you, Alice. Come in. Yeah. Sit down. Thank you. Tea? Yes, please. Francis, uh, we're quite alone, aren't we? Why, yes, of course. Why? Uh, cream? Yes, please. I just wanted to tell you that as long as the police have apparently given up on us, you and I ought to have an understanding. Really? What sort of an understanding? Uh, sugar? Yes, too, thank you. Well, uh, for one thing... When you hypnotized Joan and me several weeks ago and gave us a post-hypnotic suggestion to bring guns to Joe Mary's lecture, I wasn't hypnotized. I don't know what you mean. Is the tea strong enough? Yes, quite. I saw you shoot Joe Mary with your own gun, then with mine, and then with Joan. You're dreaming, child. Oh, no, I'm very much awake. I let you go through with your plans because, you see, I could use some money. Oh, well, that's too bad. But you won't need money very shortly. You'll never leave here alive. You were clever enough to figure out what I had done. Very well. But if you think that you can blackmail me, you're mistaken. I'll kill you with my hands. It'll make no noise. You'll never feel anything. Just my hands on your neck like this. A little while. No pain. No knowledge. No fear. All right, Mr. Oh. Adam, take your hands off Miss Barkley. Arrest her, Markham. All right, Vance. She's all yours. Yours and the state's. Miss Deering, inasmuch as you are employed by me... Would it be too much to ask you why you're not working? I'm only hired between the hours of 9 and 5, Vance. It's 5.30 now. How about breaking down and telling me how you solved the Mary murder case? All right. To begin with, when Professor Colby hypnotized the three ladies, only two of them were really hypnotized. Oh. The actual murderer, Frances Adams, fought against it, knowing her subconscious mind, which she could not control, might reveal something to us. Mm -hmm. That was the whole purpose of the experiment to find which girl would be afraid to be hypnotized. But how did you know Miss Adams was faking? Your hat pin told me. Well, how do you like that? I've been using it for months, and I never knew it could open its mouth. I touched the point of it to all three of the ladies. One of them, Frances Adams, jumped a little. That was enough to prove she wasn't hypnotized, and indicated she was the murderer, but didn't prove it. So we framed a little scene between her and Alice Barkley, and we got our proof. Well, and why did Miss Adams become a murderer? She'd once been married to Joe Mary. When he left town with his divorce, he also stole most of her jewelry and ready cash. And there you are. Oh, really? Where am I? With me, Ellen. Right at the end of the Merry Murder case.
Sergeant Heath, I tell you, this is ridiculous. Two men murdered, murdered in the same way and apparently by the same person, and you say you haven't even a single clue. What kind of a homicide department is this? It's a good one, Commissioner. Just give me a little time. These murders were only committed in the past 12 hours. But the victims were newspaper men, Heath. Do you understand? Newspaper men. The papers they worked on will needle us for days if we don't get results. I want fast work on this, do you hear me? Fast work and no alibis. We're working on it, Commissioner. And the dead men weren't really newspaper men. They were critics. Dramatic critics. Same thing. Somebody's making a joke out of this department. Killing two dramatic critics and leaving poetry pinned to their chests with a knife. Let's see those poems. Let's see them. Uh, here's the one we found on the first body, Commissioner. The body of Robert Carnes. But it's no clue. Believe me, it's no clue. Uh -huh. He was the leading critic, he always would insist. And that's the reason that I placed him first on my list. It's going to be an epidemic, that's what it's going to be. Give me the second poem, the one you found on Roger Dakin's body. Yes, sir, here you are. Yeah. It's a first-rate critic you did rate high, and the first-rate critic is the second to die. Oh, take it, take it, Heath. Yes, take sir. both of these poems and get me the man who wrote them. And get him fast before he murders every critic in the city. <laughs> Are you busy, Mr. Markham? Very busy, I mean. The district attorney is never too busy to talk of the homicide department, Chief. What is it, Heath? Well, it's a commissioner. He's riding me on those critic murders. I can't do miracles. I've checked every clue. There's nothing I've found that's any good to me. Try and tell him that, though. Hmm. Did you ever think of this motive, Heath? Well, what's that? There was a new play open at the Rex Theater last night. Perhaps both of the critics were going to print bad notices. Perhaps somebody didn't want You those can stop right there, D.A. I checked that the first thing. The notices both critics wrote were great. Mm. I'm stumped, D.A. I don't even know where to look for a killer. I see. You think that perhaps I might know someone? You mean Philo Vance? Now listen, D.A., I don't want Vance in on this case. He's all I need for me to really blow my top. Well, in that case, I won't call him. I thought for a moment that you might have been hinting that I do, but... As long as you feel so strongly, why, I wouldn't think of it. Oh, uh, what's the use? <laughs> Call him, D.A., get him to go to work. That's the reason I came up to see you in the first place. Really? Poetry and murder, what a combination. Maybe Vance can figure out what it all means. <laughs> That's the story, Vance, all of it. Definitely interesting, isn't it? I suppose so. Let me see now. The first murdered critic was Robert Carnes. Carnes, Carnes. Isn't he the one that married Edna Bowley, the dancer? Some years ago, I believe, Vance. Yes, he's the one. And wasn't she being sponsored before her marriage by Mike Wilcox, the racket king? Mike did have an interest in her. But he's hardly the poetry type, Vance. Don't forget those poems pinned to the chests of the two victims. I haven't forgotten them. Markham, there's a wonderful art exhibit at the Madison Galleries this afternoon. I was going to take Ellen and visit there. The Madison Gallery visit will be postponed because of my visit here? Precisely. Hmm. I've changed from the Madison to the Rogues Gallery. Markham, I'm going to see our friend Mike Wilcox. <laughs> My maid said you wanted to speak to me. Yeah, lady. I'm Longfellow. I work for Mike Wilcox. He wants to see you. Mike sent you here? Why? Look, I don't ask the boss questions. I'm glad he got a job. Who else would hire a guy like me? <laughs> Five foot nothing on my tiptoes. And they call you Longfellow? <laughs> Robert Quaint, isn't it? Yeah, that's everybody's idea of a gag. Are we ready to go, lady? Yes, but I don't see what Mike can want with me. After all, my husband has just been killed. It wouldn't do either of us any good if I was seen with Mike. Lady, I don't know nothing about that. Mike says to bring you down, I'm going to bring you down. Oh. That's my way of keeping my job. <laughs> yeah, and my health. Ah, if I move 
here and jump me. Get into my king row. And I'm a dead Joe. <laughs> but if I move in this square, you can't do nothing. So I move in this square. Yeah? Who is it? Hello, Mr. Wilcox. I'm Philo Vance. Oh, hi, Vance. You play checkers? Yes, but I have no desire to play at the moment. Well, no playing checkers with yourself, eh? That's a new one. Who's winning? Uh, me. <laughs> I always win. <laughs> well, Vance, the boy's downstairs, says he wanted to see me. So I says if he wants to see me, let him come up. So you're up. And what do you want to see me about? About the murder of Robert Carnes, the drama critic. The same person also killed another critic. But I'm not quite as interested in the second murder as I am in Carnes' death. You used to go with Carnes' present wife, didn't you? Edna? Sure. What about her? Nothing. Except that from what I've heard, this Carnes wasn't too kindly an individual. Maybe you resented the way he treated his wife. <laughs> and wrote them poems, too? <laughs> no. No, that I doubt very much. When did you last see Mrs. Carnes, Mr. Wilcox? Oh, a couple of years ago. Way well, I figure it'll be a couple of years before I see her again. Well, how's for a game of checkers, Vance? You look smart enough to be able to play checkers. Thank you very much, but I'm sorry I... Uh, hold it. Yeah? I got it, boss. We're here. Well, in a minute, Longy. Uh, I'll buzz you. There's nothing you can tell me about Robert Carnes' murder, Mr. Wilcox? Oh, no, not me. When I read about it, I says to myself, well, somebody must not like the critics, I said. <laughs> I guess maybe that's so, huh? Maybe. Both of them wrote their last notices and their death notices at the same time. Maybe there's some connection between the two. There may be. I'm glad it ain't my business to find out. <laughs> well, you got time for one game, Vance? Just one game? No, I think not. I'd better be moving along. Thanks, Wilcox. Maybe we'll meet again. Hmm. Okay, Longy, you can bring her in now. All right, boss. Let's see. Well, they do move here. And he's going to jump me. And I knock off two of his guys like this. <laughs> not bad, not bad, not bad. Hello, Mike. Hello, beautiful. Come on in. Me too, boss. No, I don't want you, Longfellow. Only Mrs. Carnes. Okay, I'll be out here with the boys. It's been a long time, hasn't it, Mike? Too long, beautiful. I had to talk to you. I'm sorry I had to send Longfellow for you, but I couldn't go up to your place while with the cops and all hanging around... Maybe even tap on the phones. I understand, Mike. How have things been with you? Never better. But we got to talk about you. When I heard about your husband getting knocked off, I says to myself, that dirty rat figured to get it. I've kept pretty good track how he was breaking you down. Beautiful, you need something? Dough, a mouthpiece? Anything at all? You think that I... Me, I ain't the thinking type, baby. I just got the same yen for you that I always had. And nobody's going to push you around, ever. <laughs> I don't need anything, Mike, but thanks. Thanks just the same. Mike, it wasn't you who had Robert. You didn't... Just, uh, relax, baby. Relax. I'm not even interested in who knocked your husband off. So I'll make a deal with you, huh? You don't ask me any questions. I don't ask you none. Mr. Vance's office. Miss Deering speaking. Ellen, this is Vance. Oh, where have you been, Mr. Vance? People have been calling right and left. I don't want to know anything about calls right now. Listen, Ellen, get your hat. We're going to the theater. Theater at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? What's happening there at this time? Nothing very much, unless I can make something happen. The Rex Theater in half an hour. I'll be waiting. I don't mind going to a theater when nothing's on the stage, Vance. But must we wait in the lobby? And why did you bring me down here, please? Because this is as good a place as any to start working on those poetic murders. Oh? Let me think a moment. A new play opened here last night. Robert Carnes and the other critics were here. No question about that. Both of the murdered critics, Robert Carnes and Roger Dakins, 
left and wrote excellent reviews of the show. Well, that stops the suggestion I was going to make. Stops it just like that. If it were that simple, Ellen, Markham would never have called me in. I want to get a look at the seats the critics sat in. That might mean something. Hello there, Van. Sibleton. How are you, Sibleton? Well, I hear you have a hit. That's the finest play I've ever produced. Trying to buy some tickets? Not at the moment. <laughs> Miss Deering, may I present Mr. Sibleton? How do you do, Mr. Sibleton? Do Ms. Deering. Sibleton, I'd like to go into the theater for a moment, if you don't mind. I don't mind, I guess, Vance. I just don't understand. I'm working on the murder of those two critics. Oh. I just want to look at their seats. They were both here last night. Yes, they were. I don't know what you expect to find, but come on in. I'll get the door. There. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Ellen. Thank you. Uh, which way, Mr. Sibleton? Uh, straight ahead and down the middle aisle. An empty theater's an imposing sight, don't you think, Ellen? It is, I suppose, but not for a producer who thinks he has a hit. Then it's a catastrophe. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Deering is right. Yeah. Well, I won't have that worry, not with this show. Right down this aisle. Right. By the way, it seems to me that I recall Robert Carnes panning your last show, Sibleton. Oh, he wasn't the only one. You see, we have every critic in town here on opening nights, from newspapers, magazines, trade papers. And practically every one of them took a crack at that last epic of mine. Including Roger Dakins? Well, every time Carnes pans anything, Dakins does too. Or rather did, poor fellow. In fact, the trio of Carnes, Dakins, and Moore was something every producer had nightmares about. Mm. Oh, here we are, then. Oh, good seat. Mm. Uh, who's Moore? Edward Moore. He's on the Chronicle. Oh, yes. He and Carnes and Dakins liked practically nothing this season. So this seat on the aisle was Robert Carnes, eh, Sibleton? That's right. Uh, Dakins sat next to him and uh, Moore next to Dakins. Mm -hmm. Here. Are all the seats in these few rows reserved for the press on opening nights? Oh, all of them except the first five seats in row E. Those are mine for every performance. We call them house seats. They're for me and my personal friends. You certainly give away a lot of seats on opening night, Sibleton. It must be worth it. Look at all the great publicity he gets. <laughs> oh, and the show is good, that is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Sibleton, uh, how well did you know Carnes? Oh, not very. He made sure of that. He made it a rule never to socialize with producers. Claimed it might influence his judgment. Not bad reasoning. Hmm. I've just been thinking of something. I wonder if Edward Moore would be at his newspaper at about this time. Moore, the third member of the critics' trio? Yes. Think so, Simpleton? Oh, I haven't the slightest idea. We could go back to my office and call, if you like. Yes, Mr. I Vance? think I... Is that you, Vance? What, yeah. Mr. Markham? I'm here, Markham, right down the center aisle. Right. Be with you in just a few seconds. Right. right. Do you know Mr. Markham, Simpleton? District attorney? Oh, I know him socially, of course. Hello, Vance. Ellen? Hello, Markham. Hello, Mr. Markham. Oh, hello, Simpleton. Hello, Mr. Markham. Nice to see you again. What's going on, Markham? You just interrupted a pilgrimage to the telephone. I thought I'd try to get a lead on the two poetic murders from Edward Moore. And stop right here then, Vance. Moore was found dead this afternoon with a knife in his heart and one of those silly poems pinned to his chest. Oh, what? no. He has been dead for quite some time. I'm glad you left word that you'd be here, Vance. I knew you wanted to be kept informed, so I came down myself. Moore dead, too. Vance, what is all this? Frankly, I don't know. What was written on the third note, Markham? I'll read it to you. The curtain's down, death slams the door, the play thus ends with no encore. Vance, what's happening in this city of ours? You know what's happening in this city? A murderer is going to town. This is District Attorney Markham. Three of this city's leading dramatic critics have been murdered, and all three had bits of poetry pinned to their chests when found. The poems have proved no clue at all to any of us, including Philo Vance, who has discovered only that the wife of Robert Carnes, first of the critics to die, was the former girlfriend of Mike Wilcox, racketeer. Sergeant Heath, however, has picked up a character named Longfellow, diminutive stooge for Wilcox, and Vance and I are waiting for him in my office. To be very practical about these murders, Markham, we're not doing very well. We might be doing wonderfully when Heath gets here. He's picked up that hired hand of Mike Wilcox's, you know. I hope he hasn't found the killer, Markham. Huh? Oh, not that I begrudge Heath the glory of tracking down our murderer. It's just that this is the first case I've worked on this long without even denting. I'd hate for it to turn out so simple after all that. I wouldn't hate it at all, Vance. With due respect to your great admiration for the unusual in crime... It's the ordinary criminal that makes the work of a district attorney easier. I know what you mean. 
I guess I was being a bit self-centered. All right, go on, get in there. Hey, you don't have to push. I'm getting... Get in that chair, sit down, and don't get up until I tell you to. You sure are tough around this place. Stop or you'll yawn right in your face. Uh, Sit down and shut up. Now, here he is, D.A., the guy that knifed those three critics. His name is Longfellow. Really? Why'd you do it, Longfellow? This guy is slightly off the beam. I think he's living in a dream. Get this, D.A. He worked for Mike Wilcox. Everybody knows what a torch Mike was carrying for Edna Boley when she married Robert Carnes. Carnes was pretty tough on the gal. Everybody knows that, too. So Mike sent Longfellow to bump Carnes. Really? Sure. Listen, D.A., they, they call this punk Longfellow. Everybody thinks they do that as a gag on account of he's so small. Only I find out they do it because he's spouting poetry all the time. Yes. Well, don't you get it? Spouting poetry. Those notes on the dead bodies. Poetry. This mug wanted everybody in the mob to know he knocked off Carnes and the other two, so he put oh. poems on them. Simple. Listen to him rave. Hey, D.A., you gonna let this flat foot pin a bum rap on me? I never killed nobody. I never used a knife in my life. That speaks well for your record, but very badly for your manners. Huh? Uh, never mind Vance, Longfellow. I don't... Uh... Oh, leaving Vance? I'm afraid I must tear myself away. I have an appointment with a very charming young lady, Miss Edna Carnes. Maybe you have the murderer, Sergeant Heath. If so, you can keep him. But I have an appointment, and it's quite necessary that I keep it. Yeah? Come in. Well, Wilcox. Surprised to find you here. (laughs) You don't look advanced. (laughs) Don't mind me, I'm just playing some solitaire. I understood that Mrs. Edna Carnes lived here. You're putting the Red Queen on a red king. (laughs) Don't kibitz, Vance. Sit down and play some gin if you want, but don't kibitz. How about a game of gin? I'd just as soon not right now, thanks. Ah, come on, I gotta play with somebody. Always at solitaire, can't find nobody to play with. (laughs) Maybe your friends wouldn't like what happened to them if they were to win. Okay, Vance, if that's the way you want it. What are you doing here? Paying a call on Mrs. Carnes. Where is she? She ain't home. She wouldn't want to see you even if she was home. Got you on? I'll take that. You could leave any time now, Vance. It'd be all right with me. Yeah? Hello. Is Mr. Philo Vance there, please? Yeah, he's here. For you, Vance. Thank you very much. Hello. Vance? Ellen? I called Markham and he told me where you were. Hop right back here, Vance. I'm the double. I'm sorry, Ellen. I'll be detained here for a while. I'm waiting for Mrs. Carnes to return home. She's not going to return home, Vance. She's here, right here in your office. And she's going to wait here until you get back. Go ahead, Mrs. Carnes. Tell me anything you think might help. Mr. Vance... Has it bothered you at all that there were two other critics murdered right after my husband was killed? Quite a bit, Mrs. Carnes. Frankly, I haven't the slightest idea why. I have. My husband's best friends were Roger Dakins and Edward Moore. The night he was murdered, I found a note in the library reading, If anything happens to me, Roger or Edward will know who did it. And you destroyed that note? Yes. I didn't want the police to question them. The murderer did me a favor, Mr. Vance. You don't know what a life I've led with my husband. He was impossible, completely impossible. If he hadn't threatened me, I'd have left him years ago. I see. Well, this is very interesting, Mrs. Carnes. Your husband probably told his murderer that it would do him no good to kill him because his two friends would go to the police. There was nothing for the killer to do then but wipe out Dagens and Moore. I know that now. Well, Mrs. Carnes, your actions have certainly confused us. I understood the pleasant front your husband put up in public was just a mask, but I... Everything about him was either cruel or false, from the name Robert Carnes to the brilliant words he let drop carelessly, even though he'd spent half the night thinking them up. Oh, I couldn't stand him. I just couldn't. I was thinking that when I made the appointment to see you. I thought maybe you'd killed him. Me? But I came down here to tell you all this. Doesn't that clear me? I couldn't see you at the apartment. Mike was there, so I came down to your office. That must clear me. Not necessarily, Mrs. Carnes. You might have given me some information just to throw me off. However, I'm not going to detain you. You may leave if you like. Miss Daring. Yes, Mr. Vance. Mrs. Carnes is leaving. I'm sorry you think the way you do, Mr. Vance. 
I assure you, I came down to see you with only one purpose. Thank you for coming, Mrs. Carnes. We'll meet again. Goodbye. This way, Mrs. Carnes, please. Thank you. Goodbye, Mr. Vance. Goodbye. Don't go, Miss Deering. Goodbye, Mrs. Carnes. Yes, Vance, what is it? We're finally making progress, Ellen. I know now why all three critics were murdered and that there will be no more killings, at least by the same murderer. Well, that's good news to any prospective victims. What else is up? Mrs. Carnes just let drop something I didn't know. Oh? She said that Robert Carnes was not his right name. He probably had it changed legally years ago. Find out what his name used to be, Ellen. I've got a hunch it's going to lead to something very important. You don't mind my dropping into your office at this time, do you, Mr. Silverton? Oh, not at all, Vance. I'm glad to be of service. Uh, you want to see the show tonight? I can let you have my house seat. Some other time, perhaps, but not tonight, Mr. Sibleton. All right. You told me you didn't know Roger Carnes socially. That's right, I didn't. Well, this is very strange, then. You have an odd name, Sibleton. Very unusual. <laughs> I suppose that's right. My secretary found out that Roger Carnes' real name was Sibleton. Was he a relation? My brother. Older brother. Only I never talked about that. He was nobody to be proud of. So I've heard from a number of sources. What did he have on you, Mr. Sibleton? What? It must have been something very important for you to have killed him to keep him quiet. You think I killed him? Not exactly. I know you did. You see these two tickets for your theater, Mr. Sibleton? They were dropped at the scene of your brother's murder. And they prove I killed him? Oh, now that. Oh, but they do. You see, these tickets are house seats. Your house seats. The ones that are reserved for you. You told me about them in the theater yesterday. Remember? First five seats in row E. That's what these are for. Let me have them. There's a gun in that drawer, I presume. Not anymore, there isn't. It's in my hand. I'm sorry about this, Vance. I liked you. Well enough to put that gun away? <laughs> Hardly. Well, I don't blame you. Self-preservation is still the primary law of human motivation. By the way, I know why you killed Dakins and Moore. But why did you kill your brother? Why did Cain kill Abel? My brother and I had an argument, a terrible argument. He was about to write a magazine article telling a lot of things about me that are best forgotten. They happened years ago, before we came to this country. Robert called me up to taunt me about it, and I warned him not to write it. That's another form of self-preservation. I rather thought it was something like that. Your poetry idea was very brilliant, Sibleton. You knew about Mike Wilcox and your brother's wife, didn't you? Of course. Everybody knew that. You also knew Wilcox had a little accomplice with a rather odd name of Longfellow, who on occasion was addicted to poetry. You thought the police would go to Wilcox and look no further than his hireling Longfellow. You know I've got to kill you, Vance. Kill you now. No poetry? No poetry. I'm sorry. I rather relished the wedding of the muse and murder. Markham Heath, you can come in now. What? All right, drop that gun. Oh, drop it fast. Come on in, boys. Hey, Vance. You had the police outside all the time. I ought, you to... ought to drop that gun for one thing, Sibleton. What? Sergeant Heath doesn't like to be kept waiting. All right, get him outside, boys. Oh, he got his gun. Let me go. Let go. Let... Hello, Markham. Hello, Vance. Well, you've done your part and very well, too. From here on in, I'll take it and make certain, as the book has it, that justice triumphs. Do that, Markham. And in this case, wouldn't you say that it was poetic justice? <laughs> Well, Vance, since you wound up the poetic murder case, don't you think we ought to close up shop for the day? Not especially, Ellen. You know, there still is the possibility that Markham might call. At this hour? It's uh, late, you know. At last reports, murderers weren't keeping office hours. I understand. Hmm. The only thing I don't understand is how a murderer as clever as this Silberton could have been careless enough to drop a pair of theater tickets at the scene of the first murder. Oh, he didn't drop any tickets. Well, you told me that's how he started talking. I told him I found the tickets, Ellen. In fact, I even waved a couple of tickets in front of his face. Only they were opera tickets that I'd gotten for us for next week. Why, Vance, you and the truth are becoming slight strangers of late. When you're trying to trap a murderer, Ellen, any means is fair, in my opinion. By the way, I've just composed a little couplet. Like to hear it? <laughs> Definitely. Very well, then. The last chapter's written. 
The last words, my friend, are the poetic murder case is over. We've come to the end. <laughs> driver. Please keep the change. Thanks, lady. Uh, you're quite welcome, I'm sure. Grace! Oh, Grace! David! What in the world are you doing here at this hour? Rather early, isn't it? You see, I have an appointment to interview your husband for my magazine this morning. Where did you come from? Oh, I've been away for a few days. My train just got in a little while ago, and I took a cab from the station. Really, darling? The fare from the station is about two dollars. Didn't the driver say four twenty? Did he, David? He must have come the long way. Uh, uh, come on to the house. Oh, I'm supposed to meet your husband out by the pool. He's going to demonstrate some tricks on trout fishing, which our readers will positively drool over. Well, that <laughs> magazine of yours gives you a good living, David. I wouldn't belittle it if I were you. Come on, I'll walk to the pool with you. Well, if it gave me a good enough living, you'd be married to me. Instead of Morton? Instead of J. Morton, Zachary. You think it's his money I married? It certainly wasn't because you were in love with those specimens of deep sea fishing which are mounted in his den. Or with the fact that he was perhaps the leading authority on the use of wet coachman flies for trout fishing. You're quite sure I would have married you if you'd had Jonathan's money? Reasonably. You know, Grace, I don't think I'll ever change about you. I think I've loved you from the first moment I saw you. Thank you. Well, here's the pool. You know, it's a sort of symbol of this whole place, all white and large. David! I see it, Grace. There's a body floating in the middle of the pool. Come on. It's Jonathan! Look what's lying on the edge of the pool. A fishing rod. A trout fishing rod. And the hook is attached to Jonathan. David, David, do something! I can't very well, Grace. There's nothing anybody can do for him. Now. <laughs> Did you get him, Chief? Did you? I don't think so. Maybe winged him, but he got away through that window. Casey will pick him up downstairs. I put him under the fire escape. If I remember Casey, it's more likely the killer got him. Well, Morrison, we almost had our hands on him. Almost caught the phantom killer. Now, let's go downstairs and either grab our killer or revive Casey. Pretty corny, isn't it, Vance? I don't know, Ellen. Plays like this are relaxing. That they are. They practically put me to sleep. Oh, Vance, look, that usher seems to be looking for somebody, and you left word at the box office where you'd be sitting. Mm. Boy, boy, are you looking for Philo Vance? Yes, sir. There's an important phone call in the office. It's District Attorney Markham. Markham. Ellen, will you excuse me a moment, please? A moment? I might as well say goodnight right now. If it's Markham, it's a murder. And if it's a murder, I know I won't see you until morning. All right. All right, now. I want 
want you men to go over every inch of the grounds. Somebody got in here early this morning and murdered Mr. Zachary and left some kind of a clue before he scrammed. Okay, now go out and find something for me. Rather excellent performance, Sergeant Heath. Resourceful homicide detective orders his men to bring him a clue. What do you expect they'll find? Nothing, D.A. Absolutely nothing. But I can't have him hanging around here at the pool either, can I? Oh, hello, Vance. Hello, Sergeant. District Attorney Markham and I just had a look at the late J. Morton Zachary. Pretty ugly knife he had in his chest. Any knife in any (laughs) chest ain't pretty, Vance. Well, all I know so far is his wife and that magazine editor, David Douglas, found him. What about that fishing rod that was on the edge of the pool with a hook in Zachary's clothing? Yes, please, eat something about that. A prominent fisherman found dead in a pool with a rod and reel as accessories before the fact. Rod, reel, and hook, complete with coachman fly as bait. Intriguing. I don't know about it being intriguing. All I know is I'm working on my day off. Well, the hook was attached to him, all right, and the rod lying on the edge of the pool. Why, I don't know. Or who killed him, I don't know. Glad you came, Vance. Certainly, Markham. I admire mystery plays. Ellen and I were seeing one when you phoned me. But I'm more partial to unusual real-life murder cases. Well, I gotta go to work. Hey, Morgan. Here? Get in that overgrown bathhouse and see what you can find. These articles on the ground here. The ones in the sergeant's handkerchief. I imagine they were found on the dead man. So I understand. Handkerchief, wallet with nothing unusual in it. And these keys. Oh, funny thing about these keys, Vance. Wonderful example of colonial architecture, Markham. The house, I mean. And beautifully kept ground. Vance, I was saying there's a funny thing about these keys. Yes, I know. One of them doesn't open any lock belonging to Zachary. Do you know there's a definite resemblance between colonial... Now, wait a minute, Vance. How could you possibly know that about that key? It's true, isn't it? Yes, it is true. Heath tried every one of them. Each one is for some different door or Zachary's office or car. But that shiny one in the middle, that's the one that opens nothing. Only, how did you know? Because it's the shiny one, Markham. Either it's a new key to an old lock, or it fits some door that was just constructed. Neither of which is very likely. Or it doesn't belong to any of Zachary's locks. Uh, where is Mrs. Zachary, Markham? In the house. Sergeant Heath asked her to hold herself available for questioning. He wasn't thinking of my questioning, I don't suppose, but I'm grateful just the same. If you don't mind, Markham, I think I'll join the lady. You were away for three days, Mrs. Zachary. Came home this morning. (laughs) Took a cab from the station, found Mr. Douglas here on your arrival, and the two of you discovered your husband's body? Yes. Yes, Mr. Vance. How long had Mr. Douglas been here? I don't know. He said he'd just arrived. Then it's possible that he might have killed your husband. Oh, no. No. Not David. He couldn't do anything so brutal. Oh, it's David, is it? Know him pretty well, Mrs. Zachary? Yes. Yes, I know him quite well. I was engaged to him once. Well, that's quite interesting. What time did you arrive here this morning? About nine o'clock. Nine fifteen, maybe. What time did your train get in? At... at eight... Fifty. It's about a 20-minute cab run from the station. That would bring you here at about 9.15, as you said. Hmm. Mrs. Zachary, you inherit all your husband's estate? Yes, I, I suppose so. It will be considerable, judging from this house. Was he retired? No. He was the head of a number of corporations, something to do with the manufacture of rayon. You can find out all about that at his office. I'm not particularly interested at the moment, Mrs. Zachary. Where can I find David Douglas? If you've come to arrest me, Vance, arrest me. Only don't just sit there staring at me. I'm not a police officer, Mr. Douglas. All I want to know is, did you kill Zachary? No, no, I didn't kill him. I told you I had just driven up to his house a moment before Mrs. Zachary arrived. I was there, standing there, when she got out of the cab. I paid the driver. How much did she pay the driver? She gave him a bill, a $5 bill. Told him to keep the change. That's quite a sizable tip. I rode out to the house from the station. The meter only read $2. What's the difference how big a tip it was? Besides, the fare wasn't $2. It was four something. I heard that. Get through with me, Mr. Vance. Please get through with me. You're awfully nervous, Mr. Douglas. I won't be too long now. Coincidentally, I know that you were once engaged to Mrs. Zachary. Yes, yes, I was. 
Vance, listen, I, I, I know the police let me go, but that they're watching me, waiting for me to make a false move and daring me to make one. I, I, I can't stand this anymore. I can't, I tell you. I'm going to... If you kill yourself, Douglas, it's practically a confession that you murdered Zachary. Do you want that? Oh, no, I don't want that. I, I, I don't know what I do want, but it's not that. Here. Take the gun, Vance. Take it and go away. Please go away. Please leave me alone. Thank you very much, sir. Goodbye. Well, Ellen? Well, Vance, you were right in your hunch. The railroad information just told me that there is no 850 train that Mrs. Zachary could have taken. There was a 750, though. Mm. So she arrived at her house an hour before she said she did. And she gave the cab driver $5 for a $2 run. Well, let's see now. She could have arrived at her home about 8, killed her husband, had the cab driver wait, then drive her around a while and back to the house in time to meet Douglas. Oh, got yourself a prospect, Vance? Three prospects. Mrs. Zachary, David Douglas, and a certain Hastings. Oh, what may I ask are Hastings? They're people. And this particular one is George Hastings, assistant to the late Mr. Zachary. Have you seen him yet? No, I tried to, but he sent out word that he was too busy. I think I have an idea how to talk to him, though. It seems important to find out just what Zachary's rayon business means. Well, when you get that certain look on your face, you mean business yourself. Uh, A little bit higher, Frankie. Up around the shoulders. Ah, that's better. Nothing like a massage to keep you fit, is there? Uh, There certainly isn't. Oh, uh, waiting for Frankie to get finished with me? Yes, but there's no hurry. Always said I wouldn't know what I'd do if I couldn't run over to the gym a couple of times a week to get a workout and a rub down. Oh, uh, I haven't seen you in here before. It's my first visit. Well, you'll like it here. Okay, Frankie, you can hold it up. I'll just lie here and relax a minute. You can think better when your body's in top condition, I've always thought. Oh, you sure can. And I've got to be able to think. Think fast. I'm in Rayon's. Hastings, the name. How do you do, sir? I'm Robert Williams. Rayon's, did you say? Right. Read about that fellow named Zachary who was murdered? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I was his assistant. I'm taking over the firm now. Oh, is that so? Oh, yes, yes. That murder ruined the biggest merger ever attempted. Secret merger. Zachary, representing the East, and a fellow named William Bartlett, the West. Mm -hmm. Wow. What that would have done to the industry. We'd have monopolized it. Had to keep it secret. Didn't want anyone to know. It doesn't matter now anymore, I gather. Nope. Nope. The deal was dead when Mr. Zachary got killed. Really? Mr. Hastings, I'm not Robert Williams, as I said. My name is Philo Vance. Oh, I see. I tried to make an appointment with you, but you wouldn't see me. So I followed you here to the gymnasium. You did? What for? To find out what you might know about Mr. Zachary's death. It seems to me that you know a great deal about Mr. Zachary's business. Why shouldn't I know about it? Mr. Zachary never did anything without my help. No, Mr. Hastings. Not even die. I'm glad you came with me to pick up this David Douglas, D.A. I like having you along on cases when Vance isn't along with you. I don't know why that is, Heath. Vance never objected to you. Why should he object? I never outsmarted him, did I? This is the Douglas apartment right here. Wait a minute. I'm pretty sure he did it, D.A. Just found out he was engaged to Mrs. Zachary before she married her husband in that rod and reel business. That'd be right up his alley. Come on, open up in there. Open up. Oh, oh, that shot came from Douglas' apartment. Break down the door, Heath. Here, I'll help you. All right. (coughs) Once more, I think we've got it, Heath. All right. (coughs) We're in, D.A. Oh, they're a little late. Mm. Look at him. Still holding the gun, too. Yeah, look around the apartment, Heath. And while you're at it, you might look around for another suspect who had as good a motive and opportunity to kill Mr. Zachary as the late David Douglas. This is District Attorney Markham. The Coachman murder case opened when millionaire sportsman J. Morton Zachary was found dead in his swimming pool, a fishing knife in his heart, and a rod and reel and hook complete with Coachman fly attached to him. 
Philo Vance has been to see both Zachary's widow and a Mr. Hastings, who has taken over the murdered man's business interests, and who told Vance of an impending merger between Zachary and one William Bartlett, whom Zachary had never met. One of our men, Sergeant Heath, has just reported that Mrs. Zachary, who has not been detained by the police, has just had a visitor. This information has led us to... Miss Zachary, I'm sure sorry I never got to know your husband. From what you say, he sure was a grand man. He was. He was, Mr. Bartlett, the finest. It was nice of you to come down, especially since you'd never met either of us. You had to come, ma'am. Was going to be your husband's partner. Uh, I beg your pardon. Oh, shucks, ma'am. Nobody knew about it except him and me. We was going to have our first meeting up at my place. A meeting set up for today and get real organized. Sure was a shame. Well, now, ma'am, if there's anything I can do... This is terribly rude of me, I know, but may I please come in? Mr. Vance. I apologize deeply for this intrusion. I did knock on the door, but nobody answered, and the door was open. Uh, Mr. Vance, this is Mr. Bartlett. How do you do? How are you, son? Glad to meet you. I wish it was under different conditions, but glad to meet you. I was just going in case you got something to talk to Miss Zachary private like. I'd like to talk to you, if you don't mind, Mr. Bartlett. Me, son? About what? About that merger you and Mr. Zachary were planning. Well, how'd you hear about that? I didn't even know about it until just now, Mr. Vance. A private investigator makes it his business to find out things that people in general don't know. In this case, it wasn't very difficult. Well, son, what do you want to know about the merger? Oh, I guess just why you were merging and some of the details. Well, why? Because we've been cutting each other's throats, Zachary and me, for years. One way to stop being competitors was to become partners. But we never did get to meet on account of, uh, well, asking your pardon, ma'am, on account of what happened here yesterday. <laughs> You'd never met Zachary, eh, Bartlett? I wanted to be sure of that. Nope, never. Now, now I'll be going. Now, please call on me, Miss Zachary, if there's anything I can do for you. Thank you very much. Bye, Mr. Vance. Nice to have made your acquaintance. Thank you, Mr. Bartlett. It was nice meeting you. Now, Mrs. Zachary, I think it's time you and I had a little understanding. According to what I've found out, you arrived here yesterday morning a little after 8 o'clock, not 9.15, as you said. You... you found that out? Yes. I also found the cab driver who took you out here from the station. He said he drove you here twice. Once about 8, then he waited for you, drove you around a while, and then back, at which time you met Dave Douglas here. Well? I want to know why the double cab trip, and why you told me your train arrived at 8.50. Very well. I told you that because I didn't want to be suspected. I did get here earlier. I went into the house. I looked out, and I saw Jonathan's body in the pool. And all I thought about was to get away so fast and as soon as possible. The cab was waiting, so I got in. I rode to town, and then then I came back out here again. I believe that David Douglas thought you killed your husband, Mrs. Zachary, and committed suicide in the belief that he was taking suspicion from you. He must have loved you very much. He always said he did. But taking his own life was so unnecessary. I didn't kill Jonathan. I didn't. I didn't. I tell you. Perhaps you didn't. Perhaps the explanation of who did lies in that shiny key, the fishing rod, the reel, and the hook we found attached to your husband's clothes. We'll see, Mrs. Zachary. We'll see. And now, if you don't mind, I'd like to call Mr. Markham and have him invite some people to a meeting at your swimming pool. Please, everyone, may I have your attention? Want me to keep him quiet, Vance? No, Sergeant Heath, thank you just the same. Now, we are in what I imagine was a combination bathing cabin and trophy room. Is that what it was used for, Mrs. Zachary? Yes, Mr. Vance, that's right. All of you can see that there is fishing equipment, (laughs) mounted fish, and fishing knives in this room. And that one of the fishing knives is missing from the box on my right. That is the state's Exhibit A. It's the knife that killed Mr. Zachary. Fans, fans, must you go into all the terrible details? I'm sorry, Mr. Hastings. Now, you'll notice that there's a door leading from this cabin to the pool. It's only a few short steps. Mr. Vance, I sort of wish you'd stop wasting time and get down to cases. I will, Mr. Bartlett. All in good time. Now, it is my theory that Mr. Zachary and his murderer met out here early on the morning of the murder. There was a quarrel. And in the heat of anger, the murderer seized a knife from this box and stabbed Mr. Zachary. Stop that, Mr. Vance. Stop it. Vance, stop. Mrs. Zachary is fainting. Somebody run into the kitchen and get a glass of water for Mrs. Zachary. Thanks. Uh, the kitchen's right in there. Thanks very much, Mr. Bartlett, but it won't be necessary. Thank you just the same. 
I apologize again to you, Mrs. Zachary. I'm sorry, but I must continue. The murderer stabbed Zachary. He staggered back, as I'm doing now. And through this door. Well, please follow me, all of you. Oh, yes, we will. Follow. That's fine. Thank you. Zachary staggered through this door. Teetered a moment at the edge of the pool, like this, and then fell in. Ben! Ben! Look at him. He's floating face down out to the center of the pool. Ben! I'm all right, Ellen. Don't worry. Oh, dear. Give me a hand, will you, Markham? Right here, old boy. Thanks. What in the world did you do that for, Vance? Because I already know who killed Jonathan Zachary. And now I know the reason for that fishing rod and reel. <coughs> uh, you can go now, everybody. Well, but, uh, well, Thank you for coming here. And the murderer? Well, I want to thank him for giving himself away. <laughs> Once we're here, you said to drive you here, and I did. Now tell me what this place is. It's the place, Sergeant Heap, that's going to give me the proof of who murdered Mr. Zachary. It's a hunting lodge. Look, you said after you fell in the pool that you knew who did it. I still know, but I need proof. You brought the key, Sergeant? The shiny one we found in Zachary's pocket? Sure. Only what makes you think it's going to open a door you never saw before? I'm the positive type. Come on, let's try it. Hmm. Come on, Heath, if you want to watch. I'm coming, Vance. Okay, there's the front door. Go ahead. One key, one little lock, one little Turk. Having trouble, Vance? It doesn't seem to fit. Can't understand this. Wait a minute. This lock is brand new. So? So, maybe it's been changed since the murder. Heath, drive me to the nearest town so I can find the nearest locksmith. I refuse to admit a little lock can make me so very wrong. <laughs> Yes, sir, he did put a new lock on that front door. Did it yesterday. Why would you want to know? Why? Well, I can't tell you, but I can tell you this, that I am completely indebted to you. Please accept this $5. <laughs> sure, I'll take it. Hey, I tell you what, I'll give you the lock I took off that door. Got it right here someplace. Well, that'll be very nice. Thank you very much. I assure you, I'll never forget you for this. And I'm equally certain a certain Mr. William Bartlett will never forgive you for it. <laughs> Now look, Bartlett, it's four hours since we've held you here at headquarters We've told you how we know you killed Zachary Now you tell us why you did it I don't see why the why is bothering you so much, Sergeant He Bothering me? Of course it's bothering me We know you got down to Zachary's early on the morning you murdered him You do, eh? Sure, and after you stabbed him and the body fell into the pool You remembered that the key to your hunting lodge was in Zachary's clothes So you grabbed the rod and reel It was only a trout fishing rod, but you figured it'd be strong enough And you threw the line out toward the body Did I? Yeah, you did the hook caught on Zachary's clothes. You started to reel in the line when you heard Mrs. Zachary arrive, so you dropped everything and ran. Why would I go through all that procedure, Sergeant Heath? Just to get back a key. Why shouldn't Mr. Zachary have a key to my hunting lodge? Because, according to your own story, you were never supposed to even have known him. That's why. And that key tied you up to the corpse, but good. That little description I gave you just now, that's the way it happened, wasn't it? Who saw me? I can't tell you that. Why did you kill him, Bartlett? He tried to trick me with a frame contract. I wasn't to be a partner, just an employee. We fought about it, and that's how it happened. He had the key to my hunting lodge because we had to have a secret place to meet before anybody in the industry thought we even knew each other. I had to get the key back, just like you said. He, tell me, who was it saw me, Mrs. Zachary? Tell you the truth, Bartlett, nobody saw you. Nobody? But they must have. You knew the whole story if... Nobody saw me. How'd you know? I didn't know. Philo Vance knew. But how he knew? Well, you can search me. Vance, 
please. Can we play 20 questions? Do you need 20, Ellen? I'm not sure yet. Let me start with one. How did you know it was Bartlett? Well, Bartlett said he'd never met Zachary. Yet he knew where the kitchen of the Zachary house was. Remember his telling Heath where to get a glass of water when Mrs. Zachary almost fainted? Yes, but did that prove that he murdered her husband? No, but it made it obvious that he and the murdered man had been meeting here. And if they had been meeting here, it might be that they'd met at Bartlett's Lodge. It might still further be that the shiny key Zachary had was the key to the front door of the lodge. It was, even though Bartlett tried to throw me off with a new lock. And that's all the proof you needed? Well, I helped a little. I stayed away when you went to Bartlett's Lodge, didn't I? Yes, you did. You know, someday, Ellen, our little enterprise here will be reading Vance and Deering, Private Investigators. <laughs> I can see it just as plain. Now, I can see something even plainer than that. I can see that we're at the end of the Coachman murder case. <laughs> You know, I was just thinking, Colonel Tim. Yep. If I get a few more little people to work with you in the act, it might be better entertainment. Whatever you say, Mr. Edwards. Say, I know someone who might do. A young lady. A lady, Midget? How tall is she, Tim? Oh, about my size, 33 inches. Uh-huh, that's not bad. We could bill you two as the smallest Mr. and Mrs. in the world. Sure. I'll think it over. But right now, let's get on with our rehearsal. Okay. Take your song from the middle. I'll give you a pickup. Here. <laughs> You've seen our literal village, and I guess you all have learned that it really is a small world as far as we're concerned. I've taken you through shiny town, my eeny, meeny, miny town. Now we say to tiny town, goodbye. Ah, that's swell, Colonel Tim. <laughs> Billy Edwards and company. I like the sound of that. You, La Belle Louise and her trapeze, Andy Anderson, the human giant, and Duke Miller and his magic. Not bad, not bad. Sounds good to me. Think of it, Tim. Two more weeks of rehearsal and six months in theater's book solid. If all goes well, we could go on the road two weeks from Tuesday. Yes, Mr. Edwards. But that is, if all goes well. <laughs> Homicide Department, Sergeant Heath speaking. Sergeant Heath, this is Jennings. I'm the janitor of the rehearsal building on Kearney Street. Hurry over, please, Sergeant. Please come right away. Okay, Jennings, take it easy. Tell me what happened. A man's been shot, and he's lying on the floor of one of the rooms. Hurry, Sergeant, hurry. Be right there. You, you know the man's name? Edwards. Billy Edwards. Hurry, please hurry. Don't touch anything, and don't leave till I get there. Be up in five minutes. <laughs> Our friend, the district attorney, should either not have an office on the eighth floor or else see to it that the elevators in this building run all night. Oh, right, Vance. I'll suggest that to Mr. Markham, Ellen. Stairs a little wearying for you? I'm allergic to them. <sighs> Whew. Eighth floor. 
At last. Mr. Markham's office, finally. <laughs> That's you, Vance? Right. And it's me, Ellen. Hello, you two. Hello. Sorry to get you down here at this hour, Vance, but I thought you'd be sorrier if I hadn't. Oh. I'm fairly certain I would be. What is this, Markham? What did you mean when you told me on the phone that there hadn't been a murder yet? I meant there still hasn't been one, but there has been a shooting. A theatrical manager and pianist named Billy Edwards had been shot when I called you. He's at the hospital, unconscious and in pretty bad shape. Just a shooting? I don't see why you called Vance. You'd never have forgiven me if I hadn't, Ellen. Vance, Edwards was rehearsing a vaudeville act featuring a midget, Colonel Tim. Mm -hmm. And he was shot with a midget gun. We found the gun. It's no more than two inches long. Could a gun that size mortally wound a man? Very possibly, Ellen. That type of weapon was invented in France. It uses a tiny pellet quite capable of killing a man if fired at close range and into a vulnerable spot. I imagine if Edwards recovers, Markham, he'll be able to tell you who shot him. Unquestionably, if he recovers. I see what you mean. Who else was in the act Edwards was preparing? In addition to the midget, there was a trapeze performer named Louise, a giant named Anderson, and a magician named Miller. A modified circus troupe, eh, Markham? Yes. Well, it does sound different. What was found on Edwards? Anything interesting? The usual things, except for money. Edwards had more than $700 in cash in his pocket. Really? Markham, I want to thank you. For bringing you in on this case, Vance? Yes, of course. And I'd also like to thank you to see that no word of Mr. Edwards' condition gets into the newspapers. Still time to do that? Yes, Vance. You see, I'm beginning to understand how you work. I specifically asked Heath not to release any information. Thank you. Now, if you'll tell me where I can find the people who are supposed to be in Mr. Edwards' act, I'll replace our talking with some action. <laughs> Look, Louise, why not team up with me? Even if Edwards gets better, it'll be months before he puts our act on the road now. No, Duke. I don't think it's right. I just don't. And I don't either. The least we can do is wait for Mr. Edwards to get better. Maybe he ain't gonna get better. And what happens? We lay off for months. The way I see it, Louise, you and me and the midget here, we got the same act. I'm sorry, Duke, Don't but I... give me no buts, pretty one. I've been nice and quiet, and I've been trying to show you it'd be smart to send the act out without Edwards. What if you're going to make me get tough? Where you going, Runt? Out! Just out! Hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I think he worships you, Louise. He didn't like the way I was talking to you. Now, let's get back to what you were saying. You were going to get tough. How tough? Not the way you think, baby doll. This way. Suppose the cops were to know Bill Edwards was in love with you when they found out there was a Mrs. Edwards. You're pretty low, Duke. You'd tell him, wouldn't you? I don't know. I don't know anything, except all of us ought to team up and take over those booking Edwards got. Now, I ain't a bad guy, baby, if I'm treated right. Try me out and see. I always had a yen for you. Get away from me, Duke. Keep away from me. Oh, so that's the way you want it. All right, maybe I can... There, oh, Randy. That midget see? brought the giant with that's him. That's why I went for you. Don't let him do anything to Louise. Mix you up. What Randy. is this here? He bother you, Louise? Well, uh, look, Andy, I... Well, I was just kind of talking. He bother you, Louise? He bother you, Louise? I break him in half. No. No, Andy, please. Please, it's all right. She told you, Andy. I, I didn't do nothing. She told you that. You heard her. Now keep away from me. You don't, Andy. Don't. You don't, Andy. Are you open Andy, door. Let go of me. Sure, Andy. Come on. Now oh, I throw the skunk out door. Now get your hands off me. You're well, me. This is a very pretty picture. Do you mind if I interrupt it a moment? Who are you? My name is Vance, Philo Vance. I want to see all of you about the shooting of Bill Edwards. I throw him out, Louise. No, Andy, no. Don't throw anybody out. Mr. Vance, we've already answered all the questions the police asked us. I know. But I wanted to meet all of you socially before I uncovered evidence that will send one of you to prison for a long, long time. Did you find anything, Mr. Markham? No, nothing, Heath. Well, let's keep looking. This apartment isn't very large. No. I'm sure there's something here that'll give us a lead on who shot Edwards. Oh, that's his picture there on the piano. Nice looking fella. Probably his wife next to him, huh? Probably. Hmm, it's quite pretty. Hope she doesn't mind what we're doing to her apartment when she returns here. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, Heath, 
Have you followed Vance's instructions about keeping Edwards' condition out of the newspapers? Sure, sure I did. Yeah, do I have to keep on taking orders from him? Heath, we haven't done badly by taking suggestions from Vance in the past, have we? No, only this is just a routine case, D.A. God, I guess that's it. Nothing left to look into except that trunk in the corner. Yes, well, let's look in that. Oh, come on over. We'll do it together. Okay. Sure wish Mrs. Edwards would get here. If we can't find anything, maybe at least she'd tell us something. Huh. Trunk's not locked. That's something. Yes. Uh, seems to be stuck, though. Help me, will you, D.A.? Sure. Uh, uh, holy mackerel. Look what's in it. Mrs. Edwards. Look at her neck, D.A. Those red marks. She's been choked to death. Yes. By somebody with very powerful hands. Choked to death and crammed into this trunk. Uh, Heath, I don't know what Mrs. Edwards might have been able to tell us. All I know is she'll never tell us now. I'm sorry, I can't connect you with Mr. Vance's private office. He gave me instructions that he wasn't to be disturbed. Well, I'll have him call you just as soon as he's free. Goodbye. Now, let's see. Um... Me want to see Vance. Uh, oh, oh, well, I, I'm very sorry, but uh, Mr. Vance isn't seeing anybody. <laughs> um... You must be the giant in Mr. Edwards' act. That's right. Yes. Vance here? Yes, as a matter of fact, he is. He's in that office there. He's talking to Colonel Tim, the midget. If you'd care to wait, I'm sure he'll be glad to see you when he's through. Me no wait. Me go in now. Hey, wait a minute. You can't do that. That door's locked and besides, you can't see him, I said. Me don't care what you say. Me take care of locked door like this. Hey! Well, really, what do you think, Andy? What are you doing well, here? Mr. Anderson... But nice of you to break in to see me. Vance, shall I call the police? You're I not think not, here. Ellen. Better go back to your office. Andy, you shouldn't have come here. You broke Mr. Vance's door. Me break lots of things, maybe. He bother you, Tim? No, no, Andy, not at all. He's our friend. Our friend, Andy. You see, Ellen, I'm their friend. Now, please go on back while I find out what other reason Mr. Anderson had for breaking in on me. Okay, Vance. Only there are an awful lot of funny things happening around here. Well, Colonel Tim, would you like to continue? Well, I... I think not, Mr. Vance. Not now. Andy, I'm trying to help Mr. Vance find out who shot Mr. Edwards. I just told him that he used to lend money to people in show business. You tell him that? Yep. Why? Well, because it might help Mr. Vance find out who shot Mr. Edwards. Uh, what it did, actually, was account for the large amount of cash in Mr. Edwards' pockets, Mr. Anderson. Merely that and nothing else. Yet. Uh, Duke Miller, he tell me Mr. Vance want you in his office, Tim. I think maybe he do something to you I do not like. I come here. <laughs> no. Well, um, Mr. Vance, there's nothing more I have to tell you. But uh, maybe you'll tell me something. How's Mr. Edwards feeling? Well, I'd say he's doing as well as can be expected. He still not talk? He's not conscious, Mr. Anderson, if that's what you mean. Well... Come on, Andy. Come back with me to the hotel. All right. Oh, uh, uh, Mr. Vance, I'm sorry about the door Andy broke. If you let me know how well, much... Don't it... worry about it, Colonel Tim. Come on. We go to hotel. Come sure. on, Tim. Goodbye, Mr. Vance. I'm sorry I couldn't be of any help to you. Well, that's all right. Thank you for the information you did give me. Goodbye. Bye. Uh, Come on. Ellen. Oh, coming, Vance. Well, that was quite a little party you had here. Oh, it was nothing, really. Quite an informal gathering, I assure you. They've gone. Very much so. Thank goodness. Did you find out anything? Well, I'll tell you this. I spoke to Duke Miller and Louise, the trapeze performer, at their hotel rooms. Yes. The giant and the little fellow here. Now, I've come to the conclusion that any one of the four could have shot Edwards. Well, you're certainly going out on a limb there, Vance. And so far as the weapon used is concerned, the midget pistol, it might have been fired by any of the four. Same limb, only a little further out this time. Hey, anybody at home in there? Markham, come on in. Well, what went on in here? Brawl? Who broke this glass, Vance? Hello, Markham. Well, not exactly a brawl. A giant came into my office without bothering to open the door. <laughs> it was really the door's fault. It hit him first. <laughs> Vance, I, uh, I've got some news for you. Mrs. Edwards has been murdered. Really? Mrs. Edwards? How, by another midget gun? No, she was strangled to death. Heath and I found her an hour ago. Someone with a powerful pair of hands was responsible, we're certain. There should be very little question about that. Time of death, Markham. 
Yesterday afternoon, the medical examiner says... Mm. Well, then she was killed before her husband was shot. Well, that might mean something, Van. Everything in this case might mean something, if I only knew what. Markham, the midget gun used to shoot Edwards belonged to Colonel Tim. He just told me that. He said somebody stole it from him. He also said that Edwards used to lend money to performers at high interest rates. A show business, Sherlock. Well, now I've heard everything. So Mrs. Edwards was strangled. Hmm. Well, I'll see you both soon. Where are you going, Vance? Out. Please excuse me, Markham. I'll only be about an hour if you care to wait. Vance, there are several things we ought to discuss. Later, Markham. I won't be too long. You see, I just thought of something. Goodbye. You think you go somewhere, Mr. Vance? I beg your pardon, but that's my neck. You have your arm around, Mr. Anderson. Vance, you keep away from us. Huh? You no bother me, Colonel Tim or Louise, or even Duke. Keep away, Vance. We Please. no like you bother any of us. Understand? <laughs> This is District Attorney Markham. When Billy Edwards, theatrical manager, was found shot by a midget pistol, Philo Vance uncovered four suspects. A midget, a giant, a trapeze performer, and a magician. Then, Edwards' wife was found dead, strangled. None of the suspects knows what condition Billy Edwards is in because at Vance's request, all information other than the fact that he has as yet not talked has been withheld. I have been informed that Sergeant Heath has picked up Andy Anderson, the giant, and is questioning him at this moment. They are having a bit of... Uh, uh, Look, how many of you guys does it take to hold him down? Yeah, that's better. Okay, Anderson, you're a big guy, a giant, but you could also be a murderer. Me no murderer. Now, this is the way I figure it. Edwards, the guy who was shot, was married. All right, maybe he isn't dead, but his wife is. I figure you strangled her with those big hands of yours because you were going to kill Edwards and she knew you'd threatened him in the past. Why I kill anybody? You try to make fool of me. I not let you... Oh, like I yeah. Yeah. Hold him in that chair. Don't let him get up. You want to know why you tried to kill Edwards? I'll tell you. You were in love with Louise, the trapeze performer. You knew Edwards was playing around with her, so you tried to knock him off. All right, I know a way to get you to talk. Murphy! Yes? Bring in that girl, Louise. She's in the next office. Right. I can't. Come on, come on in here, Miss LaBelle Louise. Okay. Sit right down there. That's right. Well, what do you want with me? You're the reason this giant won't talk. Make him open up. Make him confess he killed Mrs. Edwards and tried to kill Edwards. Andy. Me say nothing. Please, Andy, if you know anything to help the police, tell them. I keep quiet because of you. Yes, I know, I know, Andy. You want me to talk? I talk. Yes. This what I see. Yes, Andy. Night before Mr. Edwards is shot, I see you with little gun. Same kind as what killed Mr. Edwards. This I no want to tell police. You even have same gun with you now. This? Uh. Oh, is this the gun you mean? Yeah. This one on my charm bracelet? Yeah. Oh, Andy. <laughs> Look, Sergeant E. It's perfectly harmless, isn't it? I see. Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. That's just a toy. Me thought maybe... Maybe I shot Mr. Edwards? Uh. No, Andy, I didn't. Sergeant Heath, how is Mr. Edwards, and when can we see him? He's still unconscious. All this questioning may mean nothing if he's ever able to tell us who shot him. You can go, Louise. Oh, thank you. And, um, Andy? No, I want him here for a little while. Some more questions I just dreamed of. Uh, I see you later, Louise. Yes, of course. Goodbye. Louise. What? Oh. Did I startle you, Louise? I'm very sorry. My nerves are a little on edge, Mr. Vance. Louise, I've got to know something. I'm pretty certain, as Sergeant Heath is, that our giant friend, Andy Anderson, is in love with you. And that Colonel Tim, the midget, worships you. 
Oh, I like them both, Mr. Vance. They're really wonderful people. I'm sure they are. And I'm sure that our magician, Duke Miller, was very eager to become a very good friend of yours, too. I gathered that from outside your apartment yesterday when I met all of you for the first time. Oh, I see what you mean. You think that because they all like me and I like Mr. Edwards that they might have tried to kill him and had some other reason for murdering Mrs. Edwards. Is that right? Yes. All of them apparently wanted something from you. Your affection. Oh, I want something too, Louise. I want your help in finding which one shot Edwards. <laughs> Take it from the middle, Tim, once more. You've seen our little village, and I guess you all have learned that this really is a small world as far as we're concerned. I've taken you to Shiny Town, my eeny, meeny, miny town. Now we say to Tiny Town, goodbye. That's got nothing, you know that. Look, I play the same notes Edwards plays. Why don't you sell that song the way you did for him? I don't know. I just can't. Maybe I know a way. Tim, how much money did you borrow from Edwards? I didn't borrow from him. Don't give me that. I got a look at his notebook the last time I paid him some of the dough I owe him. He kept track of all the dough he loaned, guys. Your name was right above mine. I just don't remember the amount. How much was it? A few hundred dollars. I was going to pay him back when we started to work. You don't have to pay him back if he kicks off, do you? I don't want him to die. Then why did you shoot him? Me? I didn't. I never did. You can't go around saying things like that. Why, I'll... You'll what, Midge? Shoot me too? You owed him money and you wanted Louise. You shot him. Yeah, you stole my little gun and you killed him. Who is it? Hello? Oh, Mr. Vance. What do you want here, Vance? Well, I just want to tell both of you that we just got rather good news from the Essex Hospital. Billy Edwards is doing rather well. He's expected to regain consciousness sometime tonight. I've already told Andy Anderson and Louise, so you don't have to bother. And you won't have to worry about any more questioning. Because when Edwards comes to, he'll tell us who shot him. <laughs> Is it all right if I go into Mr. Edwards' room with these flowers? No, ma'am. Nobody gets into this hospital room, that's my orders. But I'm a nurse. I know you're a nurse. And what harm could you do? How do I know what harm you or anybody could do in there? All I know is I'm God here to see that nobody gets in Mr. Edwards' room. Very well. There's a patient up on the next floor who'll appreciate these. I'll take them up to her. Do what you like. You could save me one of them, though. How you take it home to the wife. <laughs> Officer, officer, I'm a doctor here. Please come downstairs. Next floor, there's a patient of mine getting violent. I can't restrain him. Please come help me. I can't, Doc. I'm on duty here outside this door. I gotta stay here. But this man's violent, officer. I got him tied to the bed with the sheets. He's gonna break loose at any moment. Please come down with me. Nothing can be more important than stopping a potential maniac from getting loose. Oh, well, I guess this is an emergency. And in an emergency, I'm supposed to forget orders and use my head. Nobody will be coming in here, not in this room anyhow. Lead the way, Doc. Right this way, officer. Down these stairs. If we hurry, we can get there in time. I mustn't put on the light. No, no, I mustn't. That figure on the bed. That must be Billy. He mustn't recover consciousness. This knife will make sure that he never does. All right, Heath, put that light switch what? on. All right. Oh. Hello, Louise. Completing some unfinished business. Mr. Van. And Sergeant Heath, whom you've met, of course, but not exactly in this manner. Yeah. Well, that was quite a cute way you got rid of the officer outside in order to fall for this plan of mine. Who was it helped you, Duke? Sure it was Duke. I had him turning cartwheels. He'd do anything for me. Just as you'd do anything for Billy Edwards, including murder. What? My guess is you killed his wife. He wouldn't marry you in spite of that. He turned you down. So you borrowed the little gun that Colonel Tim carried and used it on Edwards. Mm, you're too smart, Vance. 
Do you forget that I still have this knife? Now I'm going to use it on you. Oh, oh no, you yes, don't. Yes, I am. Come on now. Get away with the I'll 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 say, open it up, will you, Vance? Get a Get a cop right outside. Oh, pleasure. Thank you, she devil. Get out that door while it's head out. All right. All right, boys, take her away. All right, I got it. Right, okay, on. Vance, we got her. You can shut that door in this case anytime you like now. Sorry, Mr. Vance is not in. Goodbye. See what I'm doing for you now, Vance? Becoming a prevaricator. Is that good? Well, it isn't bad when I tell people you're not in so that you can have a little relaxation. <laughs> Vance, what gave you the idea that La Belle Louise was the murderer in the midget murder case? She did. My investigations proved that each of the four suspects involved had motive and opportunity. And the girl actually made no mistakes that pointed the finger at her. Oh, so you had to let her convict herself? Something like that. I had an idea we might run into a stalemate on this case. That's why I asked Markham at the beginning not to make any announcement of Billy Edwards' physical condition. How is he, by the way? And incidentally, you took quite a chance on Edwards' life, letting Louise loose in his room with a knife just to prove she tried to kill him once before, didn't you? There was nobody in that room, Ellen. Edwards has been dead for two days. Huh? He died soon after he was brought to the hospital. But that was something I didn't want the murderer to know. <laughs> or me either, apparently. Mm-hmm. You know something, Vance? You know what threw me off? The strangling of Mrs. Edwards. I knew it had to be somebody with a powerful pair of hands, and I thought of the giant right away. Louise was an aerial performer, Ellen, remember? She hung by her hands, did tricks with her hands and arms. They were very well developed. Mm, too bad her imagination wasn't. Of course, I know why she went to the hospital with that knife. She thought Edwards was still alive and that she had to kill him before he recovered consciousness and told the police that it was she who'd shot him. I hoped that's what she would think. I didn't know she'd get Duke to help her, but I imagined she'd need and could get some assistance. Well, the midget murder case was simply another example of the fury that lies within a woman scorned. Hmm. That's something you might remember, oh brilliant one. Any time you begin some other romance, I mean. <laughs> At the moment, I'm not concerned with beginning anything. <laughs> right now, Ellen, I'm serene, content, and quite pleased with the end of the midget murder case. you, Vance? Yes, Markham. Well, the district attorney is behind a locked door. Most interesting, Markham. How do I get in? This way, Vance. By my unlocking the door. Good evening, Vance. Hello, Markham. All this secrecy indicates an occasion I should enjoy. Am I correct? It's quite possible, Vance. Please sit down. Thank you. Well, you sent for me, Markham. I'm here. 
Shall we ask your other visitor to come in here from the next room so we can get started? You knew I had someone waiting next door? Certainly. You wouldn't lock yourself in, Markham. As long as I've known you, I've never seen you display a single evidence of fear. You locked your door, therefore you are trying to protect someone. Whom? <laughs> My only surprise is that you didn't know that, too. It's an informer, Vance, a stool pigeon. Come in, Ricker. Yeah, D.A., here I am. Ricker, this is Philo Vance. I want you to tell him what you told me a while ago. Ah, oh, gee, D.A., what I told you was personal, just between friends. Please include me among your friends, then, Ricker. Do I have to tell this guy what I told you, D.A.? I wish you would. Okay, then, okay. Listen, Vance, the D.A. and I has got a deal. When I hear something he ought to know, only nobody will tell him, I tell him, see? Nobody will tell him, so you tell him. Sure, sure. Listen, Vance, there's a dame due to hit this town this week, and she's going to start running things here the same as she ran them in the Midwest. And where she goes, trouble goes to big trouble. Killings, bank holdups, kidnappings, the works. Yeah, that's what I was telling the D.A. A woman is coming to town, and that means trouble, eh? Well, that's not too strange an association. Well, I don't know about that. All I know is this town's gonna break wide open when she shows up, and that's gonna be soon. Really? Rickard, tell me, who is this woman? You mean, what's her name? Well, search me, I don't know. All I know is she's tall and dark and terrific-looking. And she always wears dresses of one color only. Nobody knows her name. Everybody calls her the Lady in Blue. It would be my suggestion, Danny, not to let the Lady in Blue into this office. <clears throat> Legal advice or a friendly tip? A friendly tip, Danny, actuated by the fact that I wish to be retained by you as your lawyer for quite some time yet. Meaning I may not be around long running things if I let the lady in blue in here. Huh? Well, we'll see. Ah, uh, Davy, let her come in. Out, mouthpiece, that door there. Call me later. I hope you'll be able to answer the phone when I do. <clears throat> Bye. Davy, I said to send that... D Hello, Danny. Well, aren't you going to ask me to sit down, Danny? Um, uh, I am as soon as I can breathe normal again. You're the lady in blue? That's what I've been called. You knew I was coming to town? Everybody knew it. What do you want with me? I'd like to do business with you, Danny. Things are a little slow where I came from. I need activity. I can find things to do here. Things you're already doing. All right, all right, I get that. But the way you look, the way you're dressed, the way you talk, what do you want with rackets? Rackets, Danny? I'm not associated with any rackets. I do things more legitimately. My methods may be a little illegal, but my um, enterprises aren't. For instance, you're in a racket. I've suddenly decided to uh, be your partner. Nice deciding. What if I don't like? I know you brought a couple of your boys along, so don't think I'm being tough. No, you're too smart to play that way, Danny. You have a bodyguard in the next room. I have one of my boys watching him. I don't know about yours, but mine shoots straight. And often. Do we talk business? Take that hood of yours out of here, lady, and you go with him. We don't have nothing to talk about. No. Tony! Don't let him come in, Davy. You call me, lady? Davy here is giving me some trouble. Davy! He shot Davy! Only in his arm. I don't like guys that pull guns. You call me, lady? Yes, Tony. Just as a protective measure. Danny, we'll drop our business discussion for the day, but... Uh... We'll meet again. We'll meet again, lady. I promise you that. I'll find out what your game is. I'm sure you will. Only, as a glance in the next room will tell you, we're both playing the same game. But the score is one to nothing. In my favor. <laughs> How do you do, madame? 
And may I help you with your selection? It's quite possible. You own this shop? Oh, yes, I am Madame Marie. Madame, you have a beautiful figure. And I have the creation that will set off the blue of your eyes. Please come with me. We can do business here, Madame Marie. I'm not interested in gowns. I'm interested in working for you. Working? A woman like you is, is looking for a position? Uh, not exactly. Madame Marie, effective today, everything which you purchase from manufacturers here and abroad must go through me, a service for which I charge 10%. Do you understand? No. No, I do not. <laughs> you will. Oh, now, there's a beautiful gown, that blue evening model. An import, of course. How much is it? Four hundred dollars. But I still do not know what you're trying to do. I need no one to buy for me. You'll change your mind. I'll take that gown. Send it to me at the Ritzmore Suite 928. Oh, four hundred, you said? Very well, here you are. Good day, Madame Marie. Oh, uh, you'll be hearing from me. Oh, dear, what does this mean? Evelyn, I'm not to be disturbed. I'm going into my office. A thing like this cannot happen. Yeah. Monsieur Danny? Never mind the monsieur business. I got trouble enough. Danny, this is Marie from the dress shop. Six months ago, I joined your... your association. You promised me I'd never be disturbed by anyone. Just now, I was disturbed. By a tall, good-looking doll dressed in blue? Yes. She didn't know I was already a member of your association, did she? I mean, that must be it. She just didn't know. She knew all right. Only she told me she's moving in and she's doing it. I'm going to see her. Something tells me she's going to be moving right out again. Sit down, Danny. We're quite alone, and there's nothing for you to be afraid of. Do you like my new gown? I bought it today. I like the gown, lady. It's your ideas on doing business I don't like. You're cutting in on Madame Marie, I understand. Well, as long as you understand, I see no need to discuss it further. Do you like the gown really, Danny? Listen, lady, I don't like what's going on here. I was doing all right. I was doing fine. You cut yourself in. I'm not taking it, lady. I'm telling you now, I'm not taking it. But, Danny, there isn't really anything you can do. Look, would you care to take me to the theater tonight? I'll wear this new blue gown. I have some wonderful blue eyeshadow that matches and luminous stardust for my hair. You'll be very proud of me, Danny. You, uh, you want me to take you to the theater? Uh, hey, lady, you go for me a little? Why? Why? On account of you're only the most terrific dame I've ever seen, that's why. So you want me to take you to the theater? Is it a date, Danny? Oh, could be, lady, could be. So you like me a little, huh? Well, I like you a lot, lady. You got what I ain't got. Class. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, lady, come here a minute. I always wanted to know what it would feel like to have a swell dame like you in my arms. Come here, lady, come on. You want me closer? Real close? Like this? Oh, lady. Oh, lady, this is living. Hey! What did you clip me for? I step on ants when they start to crawl, Danny. You affect me the same way. Oh, I do, huh? You don't want to play then, do you? Except rough. Okay, if that's the way you want it, that's the way you're going to get it. Lady, you're going to be sorry you slapped me in a kisser. Take my word for it. Really? What are you going to do? Plenty. I'll fix you for this lady, beginning now. You know that date we had for the theater? Well, it's off. Fool around with that. Well, Mr. Markham, we got another murder. So I see, Sergeant Heath. Danny Claxton, isn't it? It was. That's the way we found him, lying face up here in his apartment, knife in his heart. Hmm. Vance will be interested in that when he gets here, Heath. Oh, incidentally, I had to wake him up. 
After all, only homicide detectives and district attorneys stay awake all night. Well, call him back and tell him to stay away, D.A. We can solve this murder without him. I'll have the guy who knocked off Claxton within a week. You know, Heath, I was living in hopes that you'd bring Claxton in one of these days so we could send him up the river where he belongs. Apparently, well, someone sent him down the river. Hello, Markham. Well, hello, Vance. Sorry to get you out of bed. I'm sorry you got out of bed, too. Good evening, Sergeant Heath. Hmm. So this is a big-time racketeer's apartment. And that a big-time racketeer's corpse. We're waiting for some men from the morgue to remove the body, Vance. Mm. Sergeant Heath has had the knife that killed Claxon taken to headquarters. Sure did. It's being checked for fingerprints right now. I hope you find some. A knife killed Claxton, eh, Markham? Yes, Vance, a knife. And now we have a corpse, and so far, three suspects. Really? Who are they? Well, there's the lady in blue whom we were warned about last night, remember, by my personal informer? Yes, of course. Then there's a cold-blooded killer named Tony who works for the lady. We got him right away, but he's out on bail. Wonderful device, that business of bail. Who's the third? A former attorney who was Danny's business advisor, a man named Smythe. Also out on bail, I suppose? Mm-hmm. Oh, Heath. Yeah, Vance? What can't I do for you? Find anything in the room that might be a clue? Not a thing. But maybe you will. You generally do. But look, don't bother me, Vance. I'm busy. Well, Vance, do you want to look around or shall we go? We might just as well go. Apparently, there are no clues to be uncovered. Coming, Sergeant Heath? Sure, I'm coming. I'll leave a man outside the door to wait for those guys from morgue. Turn off the light, will you, D.A.? Certainly. Holy mackerel, it's dark in here. <laughs> Open the door, will you, D.H.? It's right next to the switch. Certainly, I've got it right here. Don't open that door, Markham. What? Don't do it for a second, anyhow. Oh. Hey, Vance. What are you staring into a dark room for? You can't see anything. Hey, where, where'd you go? I'm over here by the body, Heath. And I did see something. Something very interesting. In the dark? Yes. You can open that door now if you like, Markham. Hey, Vance, what could you possibly see on that corpse in a dark room? I'll tell you about it sometime, Sergeant Heath. At about the same time that I tell it to the murderer. This is District Attorney Markham... The Blue Lady murder case developed as a result of the knifing of Danny Claxton, whose reign as Racket King has been challenged by a glamorous woman known as the Lady in Blue. As Vance had anticipated, there were no fingerprints on the knife. Suspects include the Lady, her favorite gunman, Tony, and a disbarred lawyer named Smythe who might well inherit Claxton's racket empire with him dead. Vance found some sort of clue in Claxton's darkened apartment after I'd asked him there, and, since all suspects are out on bail, he phoned to tell me he was going to the Ritzmore Hotel to see the lady in blue. He should be there about now. Please sit down, Mr. Vance. I've been waiting to meet you. And, uh, it's been worth waiting for. Thank you. You know, if there should be a mental contest between us, one of us must lose. In view of that and my self-confidence, I appreciate your hospitality. You mean if there is a contest, I won't win? <laughs> if you knew as much about me as I about you, you might not be so certain. We're very much alike. I'd hate to believe that. You and Danny Claxton didn't like each other, did you? Oh, I wouldn't say that exactly. He was quite fond of me. That's not difficult to understand. You know, Vance, I'd like you to tell me something. Something about me. Yes? What do you think of me? Are you quite sure you want me to tell you? Quite. Well, as a woman, you're perfectly gowned, beautiful, and exciting. Exciting, Vance? Very much so. Many men must have fallen in love with you. Many men? Yes. The one man? No. <clears throat> Is there, uh, something else I might tell you about yourself? You've told me what I wanted to hear. There's no question about that. Of course, I could go further. Let's take the surface, you. 
The gown you're wearing is startling, but it's right for you. Your jewelry is exquisite, your hair becoming fashionable, but too perfectly groomed. Nothing is wrong with you, lady. Therefore, something is wrong with you. Oh, please don't stop, Vance. If I were you, I don't think I'd strive so for effect. That hairdo of yours, for instance. What are those little things that glisten on top of it? Oh, that's stardust. When lights hit it, it has the effect of sparkling. You couldn't possibly be content to not stand out when there are no lights. A theater, for example. No, you're quite right. For occasions like that, there's a luminous stardust I use. Mm, sounds wonderful. Oh, Vance. Vance, I like you. You're the man I never met in my life. Do you understand what I mean? I think so. And under other circumstances, something might be done about that. Not under these? I'm afraid not. I'm engaged in a murder investigation. Though I must admit that for the last few moments I've neglected it a bit. Will you tell me something? Anything. Uh, within reason. Danny Claxton was murdered in his apartment last night. Were you ever in that apartment? No. So the contest commences. The gauntlet has been hurled. And the challenge accepted. Oh, expecting company. Not that I know of. I was just leaving. I'll answer the door. Lady, may I say that this has been one of the most pleasant interviews I've ever had? Just a moment. I'm glad you said that, Vance. No matter what happens from here in, I'll remember that. You did something to me. I shouldn't like what you did. But I do. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Mr. Smythe. <clears throat> Go right in. Yes. <clears throat> Lady, I've got to talk to you. Uh, what, uh, what did Vance want here? What is it you want here? Lady, I worked for Danny Claxton. I know everything he did. How he operated, who paid him, and whom he paid. I, uh, I imagine you're taking over here. <laughs> I could be valuable to you. My intention in coming here was to take over. No, I'm not so sure. I beg your pardon? Nothing. So you want to transfer your allegiance from the dead to the living, Mr. Smythe? You want to serve me. <laughs> With Danny out of the way, why not? Was it you who saw to it that Danny was out of the way? Uh, did I kill him? Why, lady, what difference does that make? <laughs> the king is dead. Long live the queen. Wait a minute, Mr. Markham. Let me go to work on this Tony here. I talk a language you can understand. Tony, sit up in that chair. Don't bother me. He's all yours, Sergeant Heath. I hope you get something out of him. You have my best wishes, but also my gravest doubts. He'll talk to you. Tony, listen. You bore me, copper. I'll bore you. I'll do something to you, but you leave me. Look, you worked for the lady in blue. She told you to knock off Danny Claxton, so you knocked him off. With a knife? Sure, with a knife. Oh, I know all about how you're a gun toter. I know your reputation, but you pulled a switch to toss us off. You hoped. You killed Claxton, didn't you? Well, did you or didn't you? Didn't I? Go away, Heath. Go far away. I guarantee nobody will look for you. You start talking or nobody will ever find you. Tony, get this. Hold it, you... Heath. Who is it? It's I, Markham. Vance. Wait a second, Vance. I'll be right out. Tony... You killed Danny Claxton, and I'm going to prove it. Hello, Vance. Glad I found you, Markham. That sounds like you've got news on the Claxton killing, Vance. Oh, that. I suspected last night who killed Claxton. You did? Certainly. This afternoon, I visited the lady in blue. Just as I was leaving, Claxton's former employee, Mr. Smythe, came in. My appearance there was very fortunate. You see, I thought I'd known who killed Claxton. But now I have proof. Well, man, don't just stand there as if you told me it looked like it might rain tomorrow. Who killed Claxton? I know, Markham. But I have no evidence that would satisfy a jury. Ask the lady in blue, her friend Tony, and Mr. Smythe up to my apartment at nine tonight. You and Heath be there, too. I think I'll supply the proof we need at that time. May 
I take the liberty of using a moment or two to describe this knife I'm holding? Come on, Vance. I've wasted enough time getting these three people up to your apartment. A moment more won't hurt, Heath. Now, please, everyone, look at this knife. It's Arabian. The handle is of ivory, and the blade solid steel. I've selected this knife because it closely resembles the one used to kill Danny Claxton. Now, for the purpose of this experiment, I need an assistant. Someone to pose as the murderer. May I ask the lady in blue? Why, certainly, Vance. What is it you'd like me to do? Well, for one thing, I'd like you to look slightly less glamorous. It's completely demoralizing, distracting, and downright inconsiderate. Really? I was hoping you'd like this gown. That's why I wore it. Mm -hmm. uh, will you take this knife, please, lady, and hold it in your right hand? Like this? That's fine. Thank you. Markham. Yes? Please stand over by the door, next to the light switch, will you? Of course. I'll be right over here. Now, Tony, please don't fall asleep. This might be interesting to you. Yeah, I know. And Mr. Smythe, <coughs> I'd like you in particular to watch and see how close I come to showing exactly how Danny Claxton was killed. First, let me ask all three of you, were any of you ever in Mr. Claxton's apartment? I never was. Not me. <coughs> well, uh... I'd been there, but not in the past week. <clears throat> very well. Now, my very intriguing lady in blue, you have the knife. I'm going to show everyone what happened the other night. You, lady, will pretend to be the murderer. I'll be Claxton. Now, you slip up behind me. Please get behind me. Throw your left arm around my neck. And as you do that, I try to reach back with my hand to seize the knife like this. Um, Vance, be careful. You're ruining my hairdo with your hands. I'm sorry. Markham... Will you turn out the lights, please, all of them? Turn out the lights? I don't know why either, Heath, but maybe I'd better turn them off. Okay. Only I don't see a thing. Neither does anybody. I think you will now. Everybody, please look at my right hand. The hand that just touched the hair of the lady in blue. Vance, your hand is glowing. Hey, what have you got on your hand, Vance? Radium? Not exactly. It's just proof that the lady in blue stabbed Claxton. You were too clever, Vance. But you'll never live to prove what you think. I'll see to it. Vance, she's got that knife. Look out. Oh, Heath, the oh. lights. Turn on those lights. Right, yes, D.A. She stabbed Vance. Heath, do something. Do something. I'll do something, all right, D.A. I'll open that door, let my cops in. We'll drag her downtown. That isn't necessary. You want me at headquarters, I'll go. Mr. Markham. Yes? You saw me stab Vance. I killed Claxton the same way. I don't know how Vance figured it, and we'll never know now. But he was right. I'm ready, Mr. Markham. Nothing's very important anymore. I've just killed the only man that ever interested me. Come in, Markham, come in. Hi, Vance. Sleep well? Wonderfully. Sorry I had to put on that act last night. Did it scare you? Definitely. Let's see that trick knife of yours, Vance. Nothing much to it, Markham. Here it is. The blade disappears into the handle when you touch the point. See? Why, yes, of course. <laughs> had me worried for a while last night, though. Oh, Vance, I know now that she killed Claxton, but you knew before. Was it whatever you found when we turned out the lights in Claxton's apartment that told you the lady in blue had killed him? Yes, it was. It was Claxton's right hand, Markham. It glowed in the dark. Because it had touched the hair of the lady in blue, and on her hair was a glamour accessory, a phosphorescent preparation known as stardust. Oh, I see. As soon as I found the lady in blue wore stardust, I knew it was she who'd been at Claxton's apartment. Ah, the lady in blue was a lovely woman, Vance. Lovely to look at. But hardly delightful to know. Though for a moment at her apartment yesterday afternoon, I was beginning to find it hard to believe that. Well, Vance, you did it again. Yes, Markham, I guess this is the end of the Blue Lady murder case. But I wish the lady in blue had had a different beginning. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.